Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the fall meeting of the Committee on Solid Earth Geophysics. I'm Torsten Becker, chair of the committee. We're pleased to present a two, day two of a two-day program on solid earth science and sea level change. Sea level rise is one of the most critical problems facing society. And the solid earth plays an important role in unraveling the evolution of sea level of a range of spatiotemporal scales. This meeting reviews the state of sea level science, discusses some of the interactions with the solid earth and explores some of the important questions that we still need to answer. Yesterday, we had overview talks on sea level, glacial isostatic adjustment and transient solid earth deformation. We started out with a fantastic overview by Ben Hamilton on mapping sea level change in space and time. What we often hear about is the global mean sea level change. And we know that over the historical instrumental time, sea level has risen on a global scale by about one millimeter per year between 1900 and uh, 1990, and about three and a half millimeters per year more recently between 95 and 2020. And this increase in sea level, we now understand has breaks down into different components. And about a third of the global increase in sea level is related to thermal expansion. And the other two thirds are related to mass increase. That mass increase is mainly due to the melting of the ice sheets, such as in Greenland and Antarctica. And as Dr. Hamilton reviewed, we now have a much better handle on how this works and how the overall budgets um, divvy out. And what is emerging, emerging is a very consistent and very robust picture of global sea level change. And the projections of that sea level change into the future, of course, are very much contingent on what happens in the way that humans modify the environment in terms of our CO2 emission pathways. But when we consider the actual impact of sea level for uh, communities, um, the regional effects become important. And we soon realize that sea level change is a very complex problem that is expressed on different spatial temporal scales. And it very much matters which process um, is considered for what time scale. And so as um, Dr. Pikuch then explained to us, in his second presentation on sea level on the solid earth insights into ocean circulation and climate, then when we ask locally as a, as a policymaker, what are the largest uncertainties on the change in sea level, then often this breaks down to understanding the ocean and atmosphere system and natural fluctuations in the climate system, such as ENSO oscillations are often the largest contribution to sea level change on a, on a local scale. These climatic and ocean circulation signals, of course, not independent from the change in the global climate system. And much is yet to be learned by integrating our understanding of ocean and climate dynamics with measurements of sea level, and in particular with me measurements of relative sea level on local scales. And we've seen much convergence between the geophysical and the oceanographic and atmospheric communities in terms of understanding this complex multi-scale problem. Now, what this meeting focuses on is the role of the solid earth and how our understanding of the long-term deformation of the lithosphere and the asthenosphere, and in fact, the convective transport of density anomalies in the asthenosphere can help us contribute to addressing this society, societally relevant challenge of understanding sea level change. And in the afternoon, we then heard from Pippa Whitehouse on what used to be neglected processes, the role of solid earth in controlling ice sheet contributions to sea level change. And there, we have a number of important interactions to consider. Now, the big, signal on global scales is that we're moving out of um, a glaciation and the reduction of the 
ice loads over time scales of tens of thousands of years over Fennoscandia and over Canada lead to glacial isostatic adjustment. Now this removal of the ice loads over tens of thousands of years does not just lead to uplift and reduction of local sea level, but it also leads to increase of sea level in other places. And the global response of the earth that is to do with the redistribution of the ice masses into the oceans, but also the change due to the removal of the attraction, the gravitational attraction of the ice loads, that plus the flexure of the elastic lithosphere leads to global, fairly complex expression of local ice loading. And so each ice sheet over Greenland and, and over Antarctica has a specific spatial pattern. And this approach of using the fingerprints of the ice loads as promising in terms of understanding where the melting happens, contributing one puzzle, one piece of the puzzle to this global complex system. So we have relative sea level, we have satellite observations, we have an understanding from the global response of the Earth that is very much to do with the structure of the lithosphere and the underlying asthenosphere that tells us about how sea level changes. Now, besides these global effects, where the structure of the Earth is telling us about how different sea level pushes things around, we also have very important regional effects. And those include that the stability of ice sheets, which is controlled by the behavior very much underneath the, 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 the carving side of the ice sheet is controlled by the motion of the grounding line. And the grounding line distinguishes between the region of the glacier that accumulates ice and the region where it loses its ice. And if that ice loss can be then accommodated by a viscoelastic response of the underlying solid earth, then if that response is fast enough on local scales, it can actually serve to stabilize the ice sheet. So regionally then on scales of 50 to 100 kilometers uh, on those scales, it is then very important to understand the flow behavior of the asthenosphere underneath the ice sheet, because if the viscosity is low enough, then the solid earth response can serve to stabilize the ice sheet and therefore in the end lead to less extreme increase in the ice associated mass in the oceans and in a different estimate of sea level. And it turns out that these viscosities are of the order of which they have been determined to be based on rock mechanics experiments, post seismic deformation and other ways of getting at the flow behavior. So there's an amazing convergence between traditionally distinct communities in mantle dynamics, rock physics, um, structural seismology, and now glaciology, ocean and atmospheres modeling to understand this very complex problem of sea level change. And in our last talk yesterday, we had Jackie Austerman tell us about using paleo sea level records to image Earth's internal structure and decide, decipher uh, drivers of sea level change. And what Dr. Austerman showed us then is that this, this global problem of having sea level and ice and glacial isostatic adjustment change the loading of the earth, we can then turn around to actually use the loading to say something about the internal response of the earth. And with that infer um, <clears throat> properties, including viscosity, which, um, which is what, what stabilizes the ice sheet in the first place. And so we have an amazing cross scale connection going between regional melting to regional response in terms of the ice solid earth interaction to global redistribution of water, which where this global distribution of water can then in turn tell us something about the interior of the earth, perhaps even including down to the commental boundary, 3000 kilometers down into the earth and, and where, where sea level <clears throat> can be used as a, as, a, as a driver, which we can then measure the Earth's response and say something about the long-term evolution of the planet. So it's a, it's a fascinating field <clears throat> um, where we still have much to learn. And one of the 
particular important points is that when we are asking about the impact of sea level change on, on communities, on, 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 on coastal communities, then it is very important to not just understand what the sea level is doing with respect to a solid earth that's assumed fixed, but also um, what the supposedly solid earth does in terms of actually moving up and down. And these vertical crustal motions that are important to understand for relative sea level is what we're going to focus on today. And we're going to have a discussion of, of, of geodetic constraints uh, on these vertical crustal motions, followed by general discussions with all of our speakers, where we will revisit these cross-scale complexities. Before we begin, I have a few announcements. This session is being recorded and will be available on our website within a few days. In addition to questions from our speakers and committee members, we plan to take questions from the audience. As noted in the previous slides, simply click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type your questions and then click send. Any questions you submit may be read aloud and included in our video recording. In the interest of time, we will skip, skip committee introductions and bios of our committee can be found on the Academy's website. Importantly, I want to thank all of our speakers and the audience again for taking the time to join us yesterday and today. And it's great to hear from each of them and I'm excited for today. I will now turn over to Jeff Freimuller who will introduce today's speakers and moderate the discussion. Hey, thank you, Torsten. Um, we're right on time and we'll, we'll stick to our, our time. So we should be right on the schedule for those of you who are uh, looking at the agenda. Um, I'm excited to hear from our two speakers uh, this afternoon, Bill Hammond and Manu Shirzai. And I know they're going to give us very informative and interesting talks. After the talks, we'll have time for questions and then we will reconvene after the break for a discussion with all of our speakers from yesterday and today. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll have some time after each talk for some questions for uh, each individual speaker and then a little bit of time at the end uh, for uh, questions for both. And uh, then we'll take a break. So first uh, up is Bill Hammond. Uh, Bill is professor of geodesy and geophysics at the University of Nevada, Reno, and a member of the Nevada Geodetic Laboratory Research Group. Um, Bill uses space geodesy to study active processes inside, inside the solid earth, a whole range of things including tectonic and seismic cycle deformation, mountain building, mantle flow, uh, geophysical loading of Earth's surface, tectonic controls on geothermal resources, and interactions between tectonic and magmatic systems. Bill, the floor is yours. Okay, can you see and hear me? Okay. Yes, looks good, Bill. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I should be used to this by now. Um, Okay, so you can see my presentation. Yes, all good. Okay, great. Um, thanks everyone. And thank you uh, to the Committee on Seismology and Geodynamics for asking me to speak here today. Um, it's a great opportunity. Uh, I'm gonna talk today about um, vertical land motion uh, from regional to global scales. Um, as constrained by GPS data, mostly. Um, vertical land motion is uh, very important for sea level rise that, have, that has been mentioned a number of times in the workshops so far. Um, so I'm not gonna get too much into the reasons why we're doing this, but I will say that, that it is, uh, it's a one-to-one -one impact on the, on the impacts that sea level rise has on coastlines. So if for example, sea level is rising three millimeters per year um, and the land is going up three millimeters per year, that, that virtually um, nullifies the impact of that sea level rise. But if it's going the other direction and there's subsidence of three millimeters per year, it can in fact double the impact of the sea level rise um, over, over time. So, so we need to know this, we need to know what the land is doing um, in order to get a full assessment of the impact of sea level rise. Um, so it's one of the fundamental observables um, and it's important for studies on all scales, both local to regional to global. It also helps close the loop between other kinds of data which constrain sea level. Um, for example, geocentric measurements of, of the rise of the sea surface, um, and connecting that to the shoreline where tide gauges collect data, um, vertical land motion is essential for closing that loop. Um, 
So we, we have a lot of GPS stations, not just near the coasts. Um, so what we're gonna look at is vertical land motion is constrained all over the land, um, not just at the coast. And this is important for recognizing the processes that contribute uh, in the solid earth to moving the land up and down. Uh, when solid earth geodynamics are the root cause, we need to understand the underlying processes as best as we can. Um, so the solid and the partially solid earth uh, vertical land motion exhibits highly variable spatial and temporal scales from things that are virtually not changing over time, over the time period of GPS observation, to things that are changing rather rapidly uh, to seasonally. Um, there's a diversity of processes that contribute to vertical land motion, um, and we're going to see a bit of those next. Um, I think Manu is going to do this too, um, so it's, it's good that we're both kind of uh, hammering on the message that, that GIA is not the only factor that contributes to vertical land motion of coastlines. Um, GIA is certainly the biggie. Uh, on Earth, it has the biggest uh, spatial scales, um, and, and I'll discuss this more later, but it has a very big impact on the overall figure of the Earth um, that changes over time. Uh, so with regard to GPS measurements, um, GIA is a very steady process. Uh, it doesn't change much, so it, it goes into the trends of the data that we're gonna look at. Um, another uh, contributor um, to vertical land motion that we know about is, is mantle flow. Uh, other aspects of mantle flow besides GIA, that is, and dyna dynamic topography. This can include things like slabs uh, moving through the mantle, tectonic slabs, uh, drips, delaminations, pieces of lithosphere that detach and sink down into the mantle can, can be removed um, from the lithosphere and allow it to move vertically through buoyant forces. Um, and when it comes to what we measure with GPS, we might be interested in how these uh, mantle uh, effects are changing over time uh, because we're not looking at the static part that supports topography, but the part that is moving and changing uh, and gives a velocity over time. Uh, and then we have other things uh, on, on Earth that move mass around the surface, such as sediment loading, uh, which is also another long-term process, which can involve viscous relaxation of the mantle and um, potentially uh, in this example, there's subsidence uh, in, the, in the Gulf Coast on the order of several millimeters per year associated with a process like this. Other things like tectonics, um, long-term motion of Vertical motion of Earth's surface results in mountain building. We know there are lots of mountains on Earth, and these, these were built largely through tectonic processes. Um, and they can have very um, uh, significant impacts on coastlines. In this example, I'm showing the terraces that are built in Southern California. Uh, how that coast has been, has been uplifting over time is very apparent uh, in the geology, and this is a very long-term process. Um, Interseismic tectonics are, is the motion of the Earth's surface that occurs between very large earthquakes. So this is shorter term. This is something that's very accessible with geodetic data. Uh, it's a medium term process on the order of hundreds to tens of thousands of years can go by between large earthquakes. Um, and we can see in this example for subduction zones, uh, this is Cascadia where the, the, the coast is going up um, interseismically because um, of convergence of the Juan de Fuca and Gorda plates uh, into North America causing a contraction which is temporarily rising the, uh, the coastline. And of course then uh, at the end of the seismic cycle or the beginning depending on your perspective, there will be a large earthquake where the coastline suddenly drops um, and there will be a very bad day, potentially tsunamis. Um, in the case of the Tohoku earthquake, the vertical land motion on the coast was about half a meter, uh, even though the uh, earthquake was way offshore uh, towards the plate boundary. Um, so that results in very significant, very rapid vertical land motion uh, that is part of the entire process. Um, other things that are uh, potentially more time variable um, include um, the effect of aquifers um, and groundwater basins, uh, how, um, uh, water content of the, in the earth um, can affect the surface motion. Um, this is very accessible with, uh, with GPS and INSAR. I think Manu is gonna talk more about this after me. Um, these can happen on very short time scales. Um, the, the, they can be uh, seasonal to decadal. 
um, and they can often depend on what people are doing and how they're pumping water out of the ground. Um, sediment compaction is another, uh, this can be a natural process um, that occurs over very long geologic times. Um, it can be related to compaction in aquifers or similar to it, um, but it can result in vertical land motion that, um, that, can, uh, that can have a, a broad impact on subsidence, uh, this example in Southern California. Um, and then we also have um, uh, the effect of, of water uh, in another way, um, how it can load the Earth's surface uh, as water moves around um, from one place to another, uh, the terrestrial hydrosphere uh, can, can load the Earth's surface from the top. So this is a, a force from, from the outside of the Earth that's loading its surface um, or unloading it uh, in the case of droughts, um, in this case, uh, in the Sierra Nevada and Coast Range in California where um, drought, uh, uh, long-term drought um, of, of no, a number of years uh, help drive uplift in the Sierra Nevada and coast ranges, in Southern California, and also responded to groundwater pumping in the Southern uh, Central Valley. So those are some processes that are there. It's not a complete list, but um, we need to recognize that there are a lot of different things going into the mill of vertical land motion. And we would like to be able to just measure it, uh, see what it is, and then see what we can do about using these, this information to interpret uh, and understand its contribution to sea level. So um, regardless of the project or of the, of the process, um, if we have precise measurements, we can measure the vertical land motion. Um, this is an example GPS station from the, uh, from the NSF's Network of the Americas. It's P534 um, near the coast north of Santa Cruz. And this GPS station is collecting data all the time. Um, and we can get uh, precision in latitude, longitude, and height um, to the order of a millimeter uh, given 24 hours of data. So about every day, we can, we can find the position of, this, of the face center of this uh, antenna uh, to about a millimeter. Um, moreover, we can put that into a global frame of reference. And a, a global frame, uh, that we use is the International Terrestrial Reference Frame, uh, version 2014. Um, and this frame is, is very useful, it's global, um, and its origin is to the Earth, is aligned with the Earth's center of mass uh, to an, a precision of about 0.2 millimeters per year. Um, so that's about how well we know where the center of the Earth is, even though it's a highly inaccessible location. Um, so, so rates of motion in this reference frame are with respect to that Earth center. Um, so this is great. Um, however, it requires a ground station, um, some money to install things like this and look at the data. Um, and preferably we want these stations to be placed in locations that are representative where the motion is representative of a large volume of Earth's crust. Uh, so we can, um, so we don't have to have too many of them. So if we have a 20 kilometer spacing, for example, uh, that those things are measuring similar signals that are happening in the solid earth. Okay, um, so data from these stations can look something like this. Uh, this is an example of uh, vertical positions over time. Um, each blue dot uh, in this time series represents one day's worth of data. Uh, we can see there's, there's a little bit of wiggling uh, in the vertical motion, um, but overall there's, there's a trend. Um, in this case, we've collected about 20 years worth of data, uh, and it seems to be um, describing a, a downward trend. If you, do, if you fit this line, the, the, the subsidence is on the order of 0.56 millimeters per year. That's, that's just a little more than half a millimeter per year. Um, and I would say that because we've collected data for so long, we can, we can be fairly certain that that subsidence is real. Um, the data are somewhat convincing that that subsidence is going on, largely because we've collected data uh, in a stable place for so long. Um, despite that, there are some, some digressions from, from perfect linearity where the time series wiggles just a little bit and the time series underneath is, is the velocity for sort of a moving average of a two and a half year window, looking at how that velocity changes over time. Um, and for the most part, it's pretty stable, but there are some digressions where for brief periods, the, the velocity changes 
by an order of magnitude and then returns to its uh, background rate. So there are some wiggles. Um, and we have to contend with that. Um, but the trend seems representative of long-term motion. And that's been borne out in many studies where we've compared the geodetic results to, to geologic processes, the movements of plates, slip rates on faults and the like. And, and for, it's very common for the geodetic rates to match up with geologic rates, suggesting that they are sensitive to long-term geologic processes. Okay, so Ben Hamilton showed this map uh, briefly uh, yesterday. Um, this is a clip from our website that shows um, the stations in uh, the United States. Um, there's something like 5,000 of them uh, in this map. So we have a lot of data. Um, at the Nevada Geodetic Lab, we're currently processing, we're just shy of 19,000 stations now globally distributed that come from hundreds of different networks around the world that, that provide open data. Um, so, so this is uh, a lot of work going out to, to the different FTP servers and uh, network web pages and the like, and pulling in, uh, going collecting and finding data um, and processing it all in a uniform way uh, using uh, the Gypsy software um, and products from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So this is a, a similar kind of map. It's the same database, uh, just done with a GNT map. Um, and it's the global distribution of GPS stations uh, in the NGL archive. Um, and in here we have um, time series that, that are up to 27 years long. Uh, in some cases we get solutions um, less than two hours from the time the data collected. So they're, they're fairly up to date. Um, and uh, and uh, this uh, in includes everything that we know of and the number of stations is still increasing. Um, the rate of discovery uh, of new stations is still positive and the number of new networks that are going in is still positive. Okay, you'll see right away that the geographic density is, is highly variable. So obviously we're gonna have very good constraints on vertical land motion in some places and not so good in others. So a, a theme of this talk is to try and show what sort of signals are there, um, where are we doing well, where are we doing not so well, um, and how can we quantify that a, a little better. Okay, so this is a, an example of um, how we use, um, how we analyze the data. Um, we're interested in, in doing robust measures of trends that are not very sensitive to lots of things that affect GPS stations and receivers. Um, these can cause outliers and uh, steps in the time series that are not necessarily known about uh, beforehand. Um, wiggles uh, from seasonality and the like. So, so we use the MIDAS robust trend estimator um, and this uh, finds the trend in the time series uh, with very little supervision and very accurately. Um, and it's very robust to um, problems. So we do that and then we also um, uh, do something on the spatial scale where we, we uh, do a robust uh, medium weighted spatial filtering of the data which does a great job at removing speckles um, and very station level uh, noise in the data. Um, and that could be used on a pixel by pixel scale uh, basis to, to interpolate the data uh, into these coherent maps of vertical land motion. Um, this one uh, shows the United States, uh, the, the, the log scale. Um, so I'm gonna change that and put it uh, into a a linear scale, which is better for seeing some of the details um, in the near zero area of vertical land motion. So there's a lot of stuff going on uh, in these maps. Um, the red is up uh, with a vertical scale of motion is minus three millimeters per year downward in blue and up three millimeters per year uh, in red. <clears throat> and the big thing in, uh, in Canada is upward motion from the glacial isostatic adjustment um, it's huge. Uh, and then there's the hinge line as it goes through zero is white um, and, the, and the four bulge collapse. Uh, Thorsten Becker mentioned this, the four bulge collapse is a, is a lithospheric flexure that goes, pushes most of the central United States downward in response to this uplift uh, in Canada. So this is an effect that's on the order of one to three millimeters per year. And it goes from Alberta all the way to the, the Southeast Atlantic coastline of the, of the Eastern United States. Uh, but there's other things besides GIA in here. We can see 
For example, a lot of coasts, a lot of um, subsidence along the Gulf Coast uh, from water and hydrocarbon uh, extraction um, in Texas and Louisiana. Uh, we also see some interesting uplift signals uh, in the Western, tectonically active Western United States. Uh, we can see some magmatic uplift in Yellowstone, uh, some post seismic relaxation from earthquakes in central Nevada. Um, we can see elastic strain accumulation on the Cascadia coastline, uh, which is going up from the process I mentioned before of convergence, the subduction zone. And then we can see um, uplift in uh, the Sierra Nevada and coast range, subsidence in the Central Valley. Um, there's a rich uh, variety of signals here, um, all of which can, um, if they're near the coastline, can affect the impact of sea level rise. Okay, so, so we want to know um, how well are we doing, not just on the US scale, but everywhere on earth where we have this large database of GPS stations, um, we're gonna take some steps to try and um, assess the database and see how well we can estimate vertical land motion uh, around the Earth's coastlines. So this map here above is, um, is based on the, on the locations of the GPS stations. What's for every point on Earth, the distance to the nearest GPS station. So this is the spatial part of the uncertainty. Um, and where it's blue, we have a, a, a short distance. You know, most of North America is, is within um, a few kilometers or maybe 10 kilometers of, uh, of a GPS station. Um, places where we're not doing so well, Asia, um, that's a function of, of our own database, not necessarily all the data that the Russians and the Chinese have, uh, but just what's in the NGL uh, database. And then Africa um, has a huge empty quarter uh, in the middle, uh, in the northern desert up there. The most extreme GPS desert in the world is right near the intersection of the boundary of uh, Egypt and Libya. Chad and Sudan. So that's the, that's the point on Earth furthest from any GPS station, not including the oceans. Okay, and then we can look at um, the statistics of this. Um, the blue bars are for, the, are for the land area and the red bars are for linear coastlines. Um, and we can see that 74% uh, of the coast is within two degrees of some GPS station. 93% uh, of the coast is within five degrees of some GPS station, which, which is pretty far if you're interested in a very fine scale, but if you're interested in a global scale, um, that's uh, not such a big deal. Okay, change, there we go. So the, when looking at the data, we can rely on things other than just the, the, um, the distance to stations as a measure of quality of VLM estimate, uh, we would also like to know well, what is the, statistically speaking, what is the, the spatial wavelength of the vertical land motion signal and how does the distance to the nearest station compare to that distance? That's, that's a better measurement of quality of your, of your VLM estimate. So we can look at the data and there's, um, there's, there's some, a lot of detail I'm gonna skip in the development of these curves, but these spatial structure functions describe sort of how the similarity in signal falls off with distance um, as you're looking at the vertical land motion data. So um, some continents have relatively long wavelengths, some areas have relatively short wavelengths, um, and we can use the local wavelength when, when, doing, um, when doing the analysis. Um, and this map below shows how the distance to the nearest GPS station compares to the, the fall off distance or, the, or where the, the spatial structure function passes through 0.5. So it's one near the station and it's zero at great distance where the SSF is 0.5 is about um, where your similarity falls off. So, so we can see that, that North America is blue, SSF is about um, one everywhere there. In Asia, we're not doing, there are some, where there are GPS stations, you get good constraint, but elsewhere, not so good. Um, Africa is surprisingly good around the coasts because most of the GPS stations that are there are near the coast where the people live. South America, it's highly variable. Australia, it's highly variable. So, so that is an assessment of the quality of the vertical land motion um, estimate that uh, is going to be built into the uncertainties um, of what I show you. 
Okay, so here is here's the actual estimate of GPS vertical rate um, as a uh, on a global map. Um, and it's the same color scale as before, minus three millimeters per year down, th three millimeters per year up in red. Um, and you can see the huge red signals um, in Northern North America and Europe, which are the GIA signal. This is the single greatest vertical land motion signal on earth and it dominates um, the Northern hemisphere. We can also see a lot, of, a lot of other little pockets of different sorts of things going on. We can recognize them uh, through various studies that have been done. Um, we can label, put labels on what some of these things are, and that helps us interpret how constant the motion may be um, and how applicable it may be for doing projections and the like. So um, I already went through a list for North America. I don't have to go through um, very many of these, but there are some interesting signals for the subduction zone in, uh, in Chile, for example, Tibet, um, and the Nepal area going up uh, from hydrological unloading, earthquake tectonics, Australia going largely downward. That's um, a topic for another day, perhaps. This uh, groundwater subsidence signaling in Angola. Um, there are lots of things that can go on and, and it does take work for each one of these locations to try and interpret it and understand whether it's um, going to be a long-term geodynamic effect or whether it's a short-term aquifer effect. Um, usually more work needs to be done. Um, but we can do things that, um, that help uh, just based on the GPS data alone. Um, for example, here, um, I've removed the, the predicted signal of the glacial isostatic adjustment, um, given one model uh, that's available online, um, the Peltier et al. I6GC model I've removed here. Um, and that takes away most of the uplift in North America and Europe. Um, it changes things in uh, Antarctica quite a bit. And it may not be doing a perfect job because there's, there's some residual signal here uh, in Canada where it seems like the GIA removal has, um, of that signal has overcorrected a bit and now there's subsidence in North America. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this uh, uh, in a second <clears throat> and how, um, how we can assess the, what is the impact overall globally of processes other than GIA um, and the overall energy in the, in the vertical land motion signal. Okay, so one thing we would, we would really like to know um, is, is whether the, the vertical land motion that we're sensing um, is going to be a long-term process or whether it's, it's highly variable over time. Uh, can we depend on it to continue at that rate uh, over the period of projections? Um, so I so showed you before how I used the, the GPS time series to, to come up with a, a time series of velocity. Um, how we can assess the, st the stability of a GPS station and how much the vertical land motion varies over time um, by looking at the GPS data itself and, and, de and uh, developing statistics on the, on the velocity time series. In this case, I'm plotting globally the, the median absolute deviation of the, the velocity time series from every station and then use GPS imaging to, to image that field. So we can see where on earth the velocities in the vertical component are highly variable and where they're relatively constant. Um, so we can see this, uh, there are places, um, the, the Greenland coast experiences not just an uplift, but an accelerating uplift uh, because the ice loss has continued to increase in rate. Um, so it's, it has a, 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 red, a red color because it's a highly variable, a time variable motion that is occurring there. Um, so while these measurements may be dependable, we know that they're, they're not constant over time. So we, we might wanna treat the east coast of Greenland um, a bit differently uh, than we do say the east coast of the United States where things tend to be relatively constant overall. <clears throat> so other places that, that tend to be highly variable over time in the GPS data are places affected by water, uh, such as Amazonia where there's a huge amount 
of seasonal precipitation. The, the, the seasonal motions here are extremely large up and down, but the GPS imaging technique that I'm applying filters out seasonality. So this is not, this is not the seasonal up and down, but this is the change in inf the inflections in rates and how they change over multi-annual periods. Um, so, so Amazonia is changing its uplift rate over time, not just in a seasonal way, but uh, uh, through inflections in its rate. Um, we can see pockets of this in California and in the Southeast. Again, um, the red is in uh, the, the California Central Great Valley where um, aquifer effects are dominating the vertical motion and they change not just seasonally, but they inflect um, with two droughts and management changes and the like. Okay, so that's, that's useful for assessing the vertical land motion that we have. Um, so we have these, this, this temporal variability and we have spatial variability. Um, it's clear from these maps um, and we can start to, to, to interrogate this and try to understand um, the significance and the source of uncertainties in the vertical land motion. Uh, so this map on the, or this plot on the left is just a, a plot of the, the nearest neighbor spatial variability of GPS vertical rate. Um, and on the horizontal axis is the temporal variability from that uh, VU time series. And we can see that the, there's very poor correlation between these two things. Um, so that is telling us that, that, that it's not just one thing going on. The earth is, very, is highly variable spatially and highly variable temporally, and these two things are not related at all. So we really need to understand both, both aspects of the uncertainty um, if we're studying vertical land motion in any given uh, location. And this plot here is just, um, it shows the, the, the temporal variability as a function of of the, the sparseness of the data that we have. Um, I mean, some GPS stations don't, don't perform perfectly, so there's gaps in the data. Um, and this shows that that, that VU uh, rate is actually rather robust and, and, the, and the, the VU time series don't change that much um, in terms of their variability um, just because the time series are sparse, given the way that we're. So we've got about a two minute warning for you. Two minutes, okay, thank you. Okay, so, so we can map the, um, the vertical land mo motion field. We're very interested in the tide gauges, of course. Ben talked about this um, and Chris talked about this yesterday. So um, we can use the, pro the, the process to map the, the, the vertical rate um, to the tide gauges. Um, this is what that looks like. Um, so we, we can do this now. And then we can use the, um, the various measurements of uncertainty that we have to determine um, quality measurements for the GPS-based vertical land motion for each tide gauge. Um, when we do this, it's based on var various um, uh, measures uh, and in the criteria, the thresholds that I've set, we got about 52% of these over 2000 tide gauges have um, pretty good uh, vertical land motion estimates. 27% um, are downright bad. Um, those include the ones that are on islands far from anywhere, including GPS stations. And then medium uh, is in the middle. They don't fall into either the good or the bad category. So we can categorize these. Um, and we can also get very, very granular, where if uh, an analyst or a, let's say a, a, a manager, a, a city manager, in this case in San Francisco, was, very, was interested in knowing what is the vertical land motion uh, at a tide gauge um, near uh, the Golden Gate Bridge in the San Francisco Bay, um, we can pull these numbers out of the analysis. Um, and for San Francisco tide gauge has been there close to hundred years, I think. The GPS stations have only been there uh, uh, for a lot less um, time, um, but we can look at their vertical rates and see that they're all um, contributing slightly different rates um, but they vary between minus a tenth of a millimeter to minus one and a half or 2.4 millimeters per year. And we can do the weighted median strategy um, to look at these different GPS stations, how they contribute um, and come up with an estimate for the vertical land motion of the tide gauge. So um, all of these are, are built into the process so, um, so that they can 
so that all these data contribute to vertical land motion estimate at that one location. Um, and since time is short, I'm gonna um, leave that and we can go back to it if there are questions. Um, but I wanted to show sort of on broader scales how um, imaging over the whole land surface um, helps us understand things about um, attributing the vertical land motion to process. So if we look at North America, um, we can see this huge uplift and subsidence from GI uh, from four bulge collapse. And we can integrate um, that, that uh, vertical land motion field to estimate the flux of material that's rising uh, in cubic kilometers per year under North America and how much is subsiding. Um, and look at the balance of that. So if you do that, um, integrating the, the, the up part of the field gives you 36 cubic kilometers per year. Um, and integrating the down part throughout all of North America gives you minus 16 cubic kilometers per year. So there's actually much more up than there is down. The balance of that is about 20 cubic kilometers of net up. Um, but because we have these models of GIA, we can subtract that out um, and show that for North America, if you do that, um, you actually get a, a, in the up areas, you subtract from the GIA and you get minus 5.4 kilometers per year. So it looks like that there's either GIA, a little error in the GIA model, or there's processes that are contributing um, to vertical land motion on a continental scale that are net subsidence. The same is true in the area that is subsiding from GIA. The, 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 the model doesn't fully account for that. So the net is downward. So, so if you forget about GIA, um, there's actually quite a lot of vertical land motion um, and it's net subsidence uh, in North America. Um, we can do this. this. This becomes highly uncertain on a global scale because we know so little about the interior of Asia um, and Africa but we get a similar kind of result, um, net upward worldwide, the upflux um, with GIA is 80 cubic kilometers down is minus 60, and we get a net up. But if you take away the GIA, um, you get a net downward around the world that is measured, right? And we're only measuring in certain places on the continent. So this could have implications, once we start being able to see the vertical land motion on a global scale, we might be able to say, well, if continents are, are going up overall because of GIA, maybe the, the sea floor is going down net overall because those are the places that are unobserved. Okay, so um, that's a little fanciful at this point because we don't have wonderful constraints everywhere uh, across the continents. But in summary, I'll just say that um, that because we have this large database, 19,000 locations um, on Earth, we can constrain vertical land motion um, well in some places, not so well in all places, but this contributes a lot to uh, measurements of relative sea level rise. Um, there are many processes that we need to be aware of when looking at this. GIA is the biggie on Earth, but there are plenty of others. Um, so we can uh, use GPS imaging for identifying and characterizing the physical processes, um, for estimating and un understanding the uncertainties, um, and for asking questions about the budget of up and down across the whole planet. Okay. And I'm sorry, I went a little over yet. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, I think what we're going to have to do is hold questions until after both of the talks. So we'll, we'll go to Manu uh, next. And then uh, we'll have a little bit of time for, um, uh, I hope for questions for both of the speakers uh, at that point. So, um, so next uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Manu Shirzai. Here. Right, so uh, Manu, Sher, Manu Shirzai is a geodesist, geophysicist, who's made significant contributions to the field of crustal deformation monitoring and modeling from space. So he specialized in spaceborne synthetic aperture radar uh, and using that um, measurement tool to uh, study groundwater hydrogeodesy, seismic and aseismic faulting processes, volcanoes, induced seismicity and fracking, and the impacts of relative sea level rise on coastal uh, areas. So uh, Manu is um, now at Virginia Tech, uh, and he is also a member of the Center for Coastal Studies at Virginia Tech. 
and has also been associated with the Southern California Earthquake Center, NSF EarthCube, uh, and a variety of other um, programs. So let me uh, uh, turn this over to Manu, please begin. And uh... thanks, Jeff. Um... Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you see my slides. So my presentation is a, a follow-up to conversation that we had yesterday and today, and uh, specifically is a continuation of the Bill's uh, great presentation. I focus on vertical land motion from a slightly different perspective. I would touch on different monitoring, modeling, and projecting uh, approaches that allows us to learn about the contemporary rate of vertical land motion and its future evolution. Uh, that's uh, needed to evaluate future hazards at the coastal area. So this figure or variation of this figure has been shown frequently uh, today and yesterday. I want to draw your attention again to this uh, important uh, parameter, which is a relative sea level rise. Uh, relative sea level rise um, very broadly defined as a difference between the elevation of the um, uh, sea surface and elevation of the land. And this is uh, arguably, uh, this is evidently the most important parameter for evaluating hazard at the coastal area. To elaborate that, I'll show you this uh, figure here. So in the literature, uh, it suggested that um, 20 centimeter rise in the sea level would uh, increase, uh, would double the frequency of the flooding around the coast of the United States. So here, what you see is a very first order uh, projection of the sea level rise at the Galveston tide gate, which is in the South Texas, and uh, the yellow one, the yellow line. So you see that that 20 centimeter threshold will be reached about 2014. However, if you add the present day subsidence rate to this value, which is about 2.5, uh, two millimeter per year at the location of the tide gauge, that threshold will be reached almost 15 years earlier. So this suggests that um, accounting for uh, sea level rise, it's a critical factor for future adaptation plan and strategies to deal with the climate change. So um, in the next few slides, I summarize what is discussed related to the factors that drive land substance field. Um, discussed a few of these uh, drivers and in the presentations yesterday, we also had quite a bit of discussion. My purpose here is to summarize those conversations and put them in a forward looking perspective. So uh, the top panel is um, a cross section across the Northern, um, uh, Northern America that goes from the west coast of the United States to the east coast. And uh, based on the geological setting and tectonic settings, um, there are different drivers that become important um, into the present day observation of the vertical land motion. So in, on the west, to begin with, we have subduction zone that oceanic plates uh, dive under the continental plates. And during the interseismic period, which is a bit between two major earthquakes, the overriding plate is squeezed, thickened, and causes the uplift. During an earthquake or co-seismic event, that accumulated stress is released, and as a result of that, we have uplift and subsidence. And this uplift and subsidence depend on the location of the shoreline with respect to the patch that is slept, uh, sleep, uh, sleep on the fall. The second mechanism that is of uh, great importance is the compaction of the aquifer. So as fluid is removed from the aquifers, pore space is cl closed and the, uh, the entire aquifer uh, compact, which manifests itself into observation, observed subsidence on the surface. This process in contrast to the tectonic process is very localized. However, the rate of this um, uh, the subsidence can be very fast and temporally non-linear. The third process that's um, uh, very uh, uh, carefully discussed yesterday is the GIA effect of um, uh, the, the rebound of the crust and of the mantle due to removal or addition of the load. So GIA uh, is one and also sediment loading is another. 
This is the process that um, causes the uh, global change in elevation of the ground at the rate of one centimeter per year where ice mass is lost and the subsidence of about one to two millimeter per year at the perimeter of that old uh, ice sheet. The, the first process uh, that is uh, mostly uh, um, uh, concerns the basins is the compaction of the sediments, but also a specific type of faulting that called gross faulting. So the compaction of the sediments is also very localized, but can impact um, a very broad area depending on the history of the sedimentation and thickness of the sediment. So in this slide, I summarize the rate and the time scale of the operation of these processes. So in the middle here, we have the contemporary rate of the sea level rise and its projections. To put everything in a context to, for you, the so sea level rise at the moment is about 3.3 millimeter and it's projected that it would increase to up to 10 if we don't do any, anything about uh, the global warming and the melting of the ice sheets. So everything that you see to the right of this uh, red uh, row that is uh, SLR are the processes that have faster rates than sea level rise. So obviously fluid extraction and sediment compaction uh, have a um, rate that is order of magnitude faster than that of um, uh, sea level rise. However, other processes that you see to the left, such as GIA, SIA, and tectonic, are often slower than sea level rise. Of course, if there is earthquake, that would over um, uh, that would uh, uh, surpass all these rates, and for a short period of time, causes the very rapid uh, subsidence or up, depending on the location. So we have uh, two major challenges when it comes to measuring coastal land substance. We need observations that are especially extensive, hundreds to thousands of kilometers, you know, coast of the United States, West Coast, Alaska, Gold Coast, East Coast, and World Coast. So they are very extensive and uh, uh, we need data that can cover them. At the same time, we need something that is has um, a management resolution, a management relevant resolution. You know, we need observations that are relevant to size of a building or street, tens of meters. And all these observations must be related to a global reference frame to be able to compare with the observation of the sea level rise. So these challenges bring us to a great opportunity, which is integration of the GNSS and interferometric synthetic aperture radar. The GNSS is discussed very um, carefully by Bill, and I will touch on the uh, sound interferometry and I describe it um, in very brief um, uh, how that works and how these two data can be combined together to address these challenges. Currently, uh, the, 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 the era of the SAR interferometry in the commercial and civil application started in the 90s by uh, missions such as ERS-1 and 2, and it continued to the present day, and it's hopefully continued within next, um, into future within the next couple of decades with the planned missions. So the radar satellites operate at different wavelengths, C, C L, and X band. And um, among these missions, I want to just draw your attention to these two, which is Sentinel-1 and A, um, uh, operated and maintained by the European Space Agency, and a NISAR, which is the joint venture between NASA and Israel, Indian Space Agency, that's hopefully going to be launched this year or next year. These two are game changers. They brought us to a golden era in the, in the sense that they have open access data policy and they provide worldwide coverage at, the, at no cost. Anybody and everybody can download this data and do anything that they want to do with it. In the next few slides, I put together a few cartoons to show how SAR interferometry works for those of you that are not familiar with it. It's very simplistic. I left out lots of details, but the, the, the general concept is present. So think about this island. This is Hawaii Island, includes, uh, comprises two main volcanoes, uh, Mauna Loa and Kilauea. Kilauea is among active, most active volcanoes in, in the world. You want to monitor this uh, volcano, this volcanic island, with uh, SAR interferometry. So satellite flies over the area, transmit the signal, collect the backscatter radar signal, and generate this SAR image. 
Then it goes around the earth and come back sometimes later at the location, which is close to the first one, but never the same. Transmit this radar signal and collect the back scatter and generate the second image. So now we have two images, two sound images taken at two different, uh, different times uh, uh, over the same area uh, from slightly different DNA geometry. By multiplying the first image with the complex conjugate of the second one, we generate an interferon. This interferogram comprises mostly um, signals due to the change in elevation and due to the topography. We are interested in the change in elevation, which is the formation. Therefore, we use a, a digital elevation model, such as the SAR-TMDEM as a reference and subtract it from this interferogram. And as a result, we generate a differential interferogram. What you see here is mostly the formation due to um, change in the change, Signal due to the change in the surface elevation, but also there are other effects such as tropospheric and ionospheric effects that can be corrected using modern and advanced processing techniques. But one thing that I have to remind you is that SAR observations are not vectors. So in SAR observations provide us with the measurement in the line of sight of satellite. So not vertical nor horizontal. In contrast, the GPS that provide us with the 3D vector. So this is actually an opportunity that we, by combining the two, we are able to solve for the 3D displacement field at an unprecedented resolution. And I'm curious, as I will show you in the next few slides. A few take home messages. So land subsidence exacerbates the hazard and risk associated with the sea level, as we all agree on. Then several natural and anthropogenic factors drive. So that include tectonic aquifer reservoir, sediment compaction, GI, and so on. INSAR enables measuring the contemporary rate of subsidence at management resolution, relevant resolution. So the next topic is the projection of this land subsidence. All we discussed uh, until this point is the measurement of the contemporary rate of the land subsidence. However, we are interested in knowing what happens in the future to develop adaptation plan and resilience plans. So therefore we need to know how this uh, land subsidence evolve in the future. In theory, that seems to be a trivial task. We develop a model, we calibrate it using a contemporary observation and we do a pro projection to the future. In practice, this is an extremely challenging task. All the physical and socioeconomic factors that drive subsidence are not a station and may vary over the time and space. I will show you a few examples here. So this is the uh, this is a simulation of the uh, uplift and subsidence associated with the earthquake cycle at the location of a GPS station P403, which is located in Cascadia. Currently, it, this station is rising, uplifting at the rate of about two millimeters per year. However, that area has been subject of the uh, major had uh, earthquakes in the historic time. So the most recent one was 17, um, uh, 100, yeah, it was beginning of 17th century and it caused about half a meter of the subsidence at this location. So we know that's going to happen, but to predict when this uplift would turn into subsidence, we have to predict earthquakes. And that's a topic of active research. And I don't know if ever we, we will be able to predict earthquakes. So therefore, Knowing the, uh, how the land subsidence and uplift evolves uh, is a challenging associated with the tectonic processes. Uh, this is an, another example for different factors. So this is the aquifer compaction at the uh, Yuangchang aquifer in Taiwan. So a very sophisticated model, mechanical model is developed to simulate uh, the behavior of the aquifer for 2007 through 2010. And then the same model is used to predict how the aquifer system behaved in the following year. And note that in the first couple of years, the calibration years, we had uh, normal precipitation or no drought, while the, the, the 2011 there is or prediction year, we had drought. And just because of that and change in the behavior and probably pumping rates, you see the model is the, the, does a poor job predicting the behavior. So, this suggests that predicting the future of the land subsidence due to aquifer compaction is also extremely challenging. GIA, I hope you all agree that is not a challenging task. 
to predict the future, at least within 21st century, in the area that is ice is not lost today. So we can assume the rate of the GIA, a vertical land motion due to GIA is steady to, through 21st century. Compaction of the sediment is another factor, another process, sorry, another process that is uh, medium challenging. So compaction rate may change in space and time due to the geology, sedimentation rate, and so on. But uh, here I show you a model simulation. So you see the compaction rates color-coded for different age of the sediment, horizontal axis, and different thickness of the sediment, vertical axis. You see that the rate changes over the time, but the change for the time scale of 20, 50, and 100, year, 100 years can be considered steady. And this is really what we care for management uh, and resilience uh, plan and ad adaptation plans. A few take home messages. So among factor driving land subsidence, the tectonic aquifer reservoir compaction process are not steady. GI can be to a good extent monotonic. To, to develop climate adaptation strategies and flood resilience plan, we need future work to develop multi-objective land subsidence forecast models. These models must integrate different factors, physical processes, socioeconomic factors, and climate forces. And all these models must be calibrated using contemporary rate of the observation of the land subsidence. This is a field of active research and some work has been done in the recent years, but there is a lot more to be done. A few case studies now. So first of all, I will talk about the entire California case study, where we monitored the 1300 kilometer um, uh, coast of California using combination of the data acquired by ALOS, uh, is a Japanese satellite operated at the L-band and uh, the operation period was 2007 through 2011, as well as the Sentinel A and B C-band satellites. We use the data between 2014 and 2019, but Sentinel is still operational and we use all G GNSS data available to UNR website, same data as Bill presented to you in, a, in his presentation. And you see here a spatial distribution of different data sets, as well as the location of the faults, active faults in the region. Combination of the INSAR and GPS data provide us with this map of the vertical land motion along the coast of California. So the pixel size is about 50 meter and we have about 30 million pixels. So compared to 10 kilometer spacing of the GPS stations, we have almost thousand fold increased in sampling rate. And the features of that you see here are very interesting. We see that the signal is dominated with long wavelengths deformation, subsidence in the south and central, and uh, between the two is the zone of uplift. And also in the north of California, we have uplift. The uplift in North California is likely to, due to the subduction. And uh, that's uh, where uh, the sense of deformation changes from the uh, strike slip to reverse faulting. The south of the California is likely to be due to the subsidences due to compaction of the sediment, as well as in San Francisco Bay Area. We suspect that most of it is due to the compaction of the sediment and bay mud specifically here. This uplift signal is very interesting. We associated that to the tectonic processes, but not San Andreas fault. These are fault that are subvertical to San Andreas fault and have reverse um, uh, sense of motion. And also we have this compaction here uh, in the basins that um, uh, drive the most of the uh, subsidence, but also there are some pull apart basins that contribute into, into the observed uh, substance. We see all different processes in play along the coast of California. I would like to draw your attention to zone of the very rapid uplift right here. One is in LA, south of LA, one is in south of the Bay, and the second one is uh, east of the San Francisco Bay Area. These are the aquifers that are rebounding by, um, at the end of the, when the recent drought ended in 2015 and aquifers are replenished thanks to the management, water management um, plans. And the uh, aquifer shows uh, uplift, uh, which is very interesting. So to compare or validate this result, we use GPS, a subset of GPS observations. Uh, this 
GPS stations have very small standard deviation, less than two millimeter per year. And as you see here, each circle represents two observations. The field color is the GNSS observation, GPS, and the edge is the INSAR measurement. So there is a good agreement, but also there are some disagreements. For example, here and here, you see there is disagreement between the two. Most of that disagreement is because the observation periods are different. Otherwise, where we have overlapping observation period for GPS and INSAR, we, we achieve very good comparison between the two with the standard deviation of difference less than one millimeter, which is remarkable. We did a little bit more with that. We did some exposure analysis. We estimated how many people along the coast of California are exposed to subsidence. This is not flooding. Flooding is a nexus. It's just how many people are exposed to flooding. And we see that um, hundreds of thousands and actually millions are affected or exposed to subsidence. For example, in San Francisco Bay Area, uh, about 800,000 people are uh, exposed to subsidence at a rate faster than one millimeter per year. And the number for Los Angeles and San Diego is over 2.3 million, which is very um, uh, important number to pay attention because subsidence can cause other hazards and damage to infra infrastructure in addition to, to exacerbating the sea level rise. Some take home messages for this part of the conversation. So combination of the multi-track INSAR and GNSS uh, data enables measuring VLM along the coast of California at 1,000 1, kilometer extent with meter resolution. We estimate something between 4.3 and 8.7 million people are likely exposed to substance rate faster than one millimeter per year. And the last part is very important, last take-home message. So SAR data are available globally. And we demonstrated that techn technolo technologically it's feasible to process and compute this data at large scale. However, very little work is done in this field. So this is something that requires special attention by funding agencies and my colleagues to, to do this for entire um, world coast and provide data that is management resolution at tens of meters uh, spatial resolution. A few case studies know about uh, how, how this subsidence allows us to shed light on the future inundation hazard. So I zoom into the San Francisco Bay Area where I just show you the subsidence. I mask out the uplift signal. So everything that you see here is subsidence. And uh, most of the subsidence occur where we have um, bay mud and sediment that are um, compacting under their own weight. So combination of this um, observation of the subsidence, um, uh, present day subsidence, together with the projection of the sea level rise that are available for the, for the region, enables us to tell something about the future of the inundation in the region. But to do that, we have to project land subsidence forward. So assuming that most of the observed subsidence is due to the compaction, we build a mechanical model that tells you about the compaction rate of the sediments for different age and different thickness. We found out that for the typical thickness of sediment in the Bay Area, which is 10 to 30 meters, the compaction rate um, is near steady. So assuming a linear rate uh, would cause only 14% error in our future projection, which is negligible compared to other source of error. So without any uh, worry, um, significant worry, we project, extrapolate this subsidence forward using a linear model. Combination of those linearly uh, extrapolated subsidence with observation of the sea level rise uh, provide us with many different scenarios of inundation for the Bay Area. I'll show you here only one example, and that's the uh, combination of the sea level rise under the RCP 8.5 scenario by 2100. Assuming only sea level rise, we estimated about 168 square kilometer will be inundated. Adding the land subsidence to that, increase this amount to, to 218 square kilometers. So I would skip this next slide, which is a zoom into the Foster City and San Francisco um, International uh, Airport to highlight a few examples. And I would talk about next case study along the Gulf Coast, which is very uh, recent. It's just a paper um, Megan Miller, my former student, currently at JPL, submitted to GRL. 
So what she has done in this study, um, combined all INSAR data, um, including Sentinel and ALUS with observation of the uh, LIDAR and projection of the sea level rise over the Houston and Galveston area, which is marked here in this white box. The observation of the vertical land motion for the area is shown here. So what you see here is mostly subsidence at a rate of few millimeters for most of the Houston area and also the Galveston. And the driver of this subsidence is mostly compaction of the sediment, residual compaction of the aquifers, some tectonic signal as well as the salt um, directors play a role. And I believe there is uh, some effect from GIA, might be very weak, but still it's likely to have some co contribution from the GI effect. I'm not 100% sure about the last one. So assuming only land subsidence, so magically somehow we stop the sea level to rise, sea level rise, only due to the land subsidence, we expect to have 76 square kilometer inundated by year 2100, which is mostly at the Galveston Island and also Galveston Bay area. So adding to that, the effect of the sea level rise under the scenario of the RCP 8.5, and also adding to that effect of the storm surges. The storm surges are an important factor in the Gulf Coast area, and as they are subject to uh, destructive uh, hurricanes and cyclones frequently every year, and we believe that frequency and intensity of those cyclones are uh, amplified in the recent years due to the climate change. So we see that large part of the Galveston Bay and the uh, Houston area will be inundated under this worst case scenario. Uh, I, I note that we, we, we don't distinguish between inundation and flooding. Inundation is the permanent flooding while the flooding itself uh, is temporary. So, and the storm usually causes flooding on, on, and under certain conditions that would result into permanent inundation. I just did, did not make the distinction here, but please pay attention to that uh, factor. So we, we estimated under this uh, worst case scenario, something uh, like 1,200 square kilometer will be inundated by the one, 2,100. So if you take home messages for this last uh, chunk of the presentation, it's important to remember, even without sea level rise, flooding hazard may increase due to continued coastal land subsidence. In San Francisco Bay, we estimated that something between 125 square kilometer to 429 square kilometer will be inundated due to the sea level rise and uh, uh, land subsidence by 2100. And in Houston area, something about 186 to 1157 square kilometer is subject to inundation by 2100 given SLR, a different SLR, different uh, storm surge and land subsidence uh, scenarios. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Manu. Um, so we've got a few minutes. Uh, I think we'll use a few minutes for questions uh, from the committee uh, for Manu, and then we'll bring Bill back in and we'll take questions uh, from the committee and from the attendees um, uh, on that. Let me, um, let me start out with a question um, uh, for you, Manu, uh, in terms of um, what do you think are really the biggest opportunities for advances here in, in the future? Is it simply really getting more data from more places uh, or, um, or do we need some modeling or theoretical advances to, to go along with it? I, I think we may need both. So, you know, GPS data are uh, looking great, but we need a lot more GPS, GPS station, but also we need to exploit all this open access, mm -hmm. open publicly available archive of the SAR data and process them in combination with GNSS data to produce a, a community model, a community vertical land motion for the entire coast of the United States and the world. So this is the opportunity is available, data is available. We need just resources to get that done, but also we need models. So for example, sea level rise um, scenarios are very well established. They have significant uncertainties due to different processes, 
but the mechanism and process is very well known. Still, we do not have, uh, for instance, a predictive model for the Cooper that take into account different behavior of the uh, you know, uh, users, you know, different climate factors which drive the, 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 uh, the pumping of the groundwater. These are things that uh, need um, additional work, future research, and it's interdisciplinary. We need different disciplines, different experts get together to build those multi-objective uh, multi um, predictive models to be able to generate something that is comparable to a future projection of the sea level rise. Okay, great. Um, let's see, next we have a question from Cindy Evinger. Yes, um, thanks so much for a really interesting talk. I, ha um, you, I wanted to follow up on a point that you made in your work with Miller, um, uh, your student Miller. You inferred that you were also using differential LIDAR uh, or, or were you comparing the inside of LIDAR or do you have experience with differential LIDAR that would be relevant to this problem? Um, Right, we did not use differential, yeah. differential LIDAR, we use LIDAR digital elevation model. So to, to okay. you know, INSAR provide us with the higher resolution and to, to generate a map of the inundation that is again, management re relevant, management resolution relevant, we need a DM that has high resolution and high accuracy. So this LIDAR DEM is the tool that we use uh, provided by NOAA, I believe, and USGS. So how were differential yeah, LIDAR? My... Yeah, go ahead. So oh, differential LIDAR can be used to, to study how the, how the coastal communities are evolving, you know, how the infrastructures evolve and so on. But for measuring the formation, I'm not quite certain that differential LIDAR provide us with the enough accuracy for measuring uh, deformation rates at the at as a slow as one or two millimeter per year. Thank okay, you. I th thanks. I think a related question to that, uh, which actually comes from one of our attendees, is how sensitive are those the predictions? And this would be, I think, the inundation and flooding predictions to the DEM. And uh, do we have coastal DEMs everywhere that are good enough uh, to do that, or do we need better data? Right. So let me answer the second question first. We have LiDAR DEMs with good accuracy for most of the United States coast and Australia and some area in the Europe, but uh, Asia is lacking that in most places and Africa, I believe we have none. So the accuracy is good. So the, the latest DEM, LiDAR DEM that I work with has accuracy better than a couple of centimeters in vertical direction. But any error that we have in the LiDAR de DEM will be directly translated into that inundation hazard map that we have seen. And we have very little control on that part. We do always uh, due diligence. You know, we do the error analysis. We provide everything with the certain, certain uncertainty ranges. But we cannot reduce that bias or error in the DEM. Okay, great. I'd like to bring uh, Bill uh, back, and, and I've got a, a couple of questions here, um, one, one specifically for Manu, and then one I'd like to see both of you address. So the specific question for Manu is, uh, could you say a little bit more about how you combine the INSAR line of sight and the GPS uh, 3D measurements? Right. And, then, um, and then if you and Bill could both talk about the issue of time dependence and time variation. You hinted at it uh, when you were talking about some of the aquifers. And, uh, and so I think, uh, yeah, if you could say a little bit more about that and then I have a more specific question for Bill on the same topic. Sure, so the answer to the question is a little bit technical. We built um, a column and filter structures, a structure that combine inside line of sight with horizontal GPS displacement. We do not combine the vertical GPS displacement. So, and the advantage is that we have multiple uh, viewing geometry. So for example, ascending, descending from one satellite and ascending from another satellite, that provides us with three observation. And G GNSS provides us with two horizontal observation, but they're at the lower resolution. So we oversample G GNSS horizontal displacement at, a, at the location of INSAR pixel 
that provide us with five observation and three unknowns. And we would build something in an error analysis and adjustment, we call it um, generalized model, which is a, a stochastic model. Uh, and we use uh, least squares to, uh, to invert that model and solve for those three parameters in space. And then we use a Kalman filter to, to, to reduce the temporal noise. So it described in the supplement of the paper, both papers, the, the science advances paper in 2018 and 2020. And I have the software available for anybody who is interested. Okay, great. And Bill, um, are you, uh, if you could turn your video back on. I, I, oh, there, he's allowing me to start my video now. Okay. Oh, great, yes. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, I think if you could talk a little bit more about the time dependence, and in particular, I'm kind of wondering about different time scales for time dependence. I mean, I think you used like a two and a half year window, and you'd see more or less variation if you used a longer or shorter window okay. and so on. And, and if you could maybe address that, then we could hear a little bit about, uh, particularly for this INSAR GPS combination, where we're trying to get a rate from something that might actually be a little bit variable in time and how, how we can deal with that. Yeah, so so there, it's a it's a complicated topic, but the um, both the GPS and the INSAR do allow for estimation of time variable motion, right? Over whatever the period of observation is, both techniques can be used to look at um, the variation in rates um, in various ways, um, even when they're combined together. So so that those kinds of motions are accessible um, from the techniques, but. What, what so many people are interested in and what so many of the models they are relying on are, are trends. And, and so a lot of effort has gone into isolating what is, what is the trend in the data that is most, it's just like climate, you know, we, got, we know it wiggles all over the place, but we wanna know what trend is it going, we're getting hotter or colder uh, on average. So, um, so with GPS, um, the, your, your capacity to do that is, dependent very much on how long the observation is. Um, and we have stations now that have been around for 27 years, that's great, but most of them have not been around that long. Um, so, so the future is bright, as long as we can convince people to maintain their networks for a long time, we're the, it's good, just gonna get better and better and better and better. And a lot of the gaps that you saw in the maps are because not, not because there's no station there, but because the station hadn't been collecting data long enough um, for me to include it. You know, I have a threshold, it's, it's gotta be there a couple of years or something. Um, mm -hmm. So, so, the, so station, many stations are there that haven't had a long observation history. So the trends are not very well understood, though they, they're good, perfectly fine for capturing an earthquake or something like that. Um, so we do better on different types of process depending on, status of the network. Um, when it comes to these, these other areas, you know, Asia is not um, completely blank to the Asians. <laughs> they, they have collected a lot of data. There's just not in our database necessarily, the raw RINEX observations um, aren't in our database, but they're, that, they're out there. And, and certainly tables in published papers, even in US journals um, can be mined um, to, to improve the overall model um, of trends, um, because there's data there that 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 could could improve the constraint overall. Um, and then, of course, work can be done to to develop collaborations with people, other countries. Um, geodetic diplomacy can be employed um, in order to get more data accessible to labs like ours that are willing to to process it. Um, and and we we put everything online, so you can go to our webpage and. And we'll, we'll, we'll process any data for free from a continuous station, as long as the operator is willing to, to agree that the products can go online for everybody. That's, that's the deal. Um, so we're, we're willing to do the work if, if the um, operators are willing to share the results. Okay, great. Now, let me go uh, next to Torsten Becker and I'll just encourage the attendees also go ahead and put your questions in the uh, Q&A box. Uh, because we are uh, looking at those questions and kind of bringing them to the speakers as well as the ones from the committee. So, Torsten. Thanks to both of you for great presentations. I guess 
asking about the integration, right? We've heard that it would be great to have a GPS station at every, um, uh, you know, tight gauge, for example, before. I just wonder if both of you could comment on what are the bottlenecks in, in, in integrating INSAR and GPS, uh, you know, I think, you know, for co-signing like processes, it's clear that the closer to the fault you are, you have decorrelation. And, 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 and what do we need next to really merge things for an integrated vertical product? And also, you know, how can we fold in, say, the hydrological observations and, you know, things like from grace follow-up to sort of correct for, you know, um, remaining signals? You want to go first, Manu? Uh, please, you go first. I mean... Okay. I talk a lot, so I would go next. Yeah, um, yeah so, so, I mean, the, these combinations could be done between INSAR and GPS very effectively, I think, where the GPS network is, is great. Um, and and so, so you, you're dependent on that. Even having one GPS station in the, in the field is an improvement um, because you can use that as a calibration. Uh, you can look at the pixel in the INSAR time series um, and compare that uh, to, to the one point where you have a GPS station, and, and that is an improvement. Um, so so you're, you're always better off combining, in, in, in my opinion, mm -hmm. almost always better off in combining opinion, right. my opinion. Um, and uh, and that, that goes, you know, that's a lesson for both the GPS people and the INSAR people. Um, and it's, they're, they're both demanding techniques. So we're not all great at both of them. Um, and we have to get together uh, mm -hmm. specific projects to, to, to do the integrations to best effect. Um, so, I mean, that said, there, the devil's in the details because you might have a great GPS network now, but all your INSAR data was collected between f 10 and five years ago. Um, and so you have excellent, products, but they're co collected over different time periods. Um, uh, now we have global Sentinel, so that's less of an issue, but really the Sentinel time series is on the order of, I don't know many, what, six, seven years? Um, About six uh, years now. Yeah, so, so, so if we had a GPS station for six years, we would say that's good enough. We'll, we'll get a vertical rate from that. Um, INSAR is blanket coverage, but has greater uncertainty in in its individual pixels in terms of rate. Um, and so you might want an even longer time series for, for INSAR if you wanna get down to the rates that we come to expect from a GPS, continuous GPS station. Um, so we don't have very, very long time series unless we start stitching together these different systems going back to Envisat, ESA, and doing all, like Manu already mentioned this, combining all the data into one giant analysis, it's, it's very demanding computationally, but certainly within the bounds of, mm -hmm. of the computer systems we have now, um, it could be done. Right, I, I second what uh, Bill said. I don't think that at the moment question is the technology and methods, they are out there. So, and the combination of the GPS and GNSS has been done by adding more uh, G, sorry, GPS and INSAR has been done. By adding new satellites and new GPS station, we just make the outcome better. But the technology is out there. What we need is infrastructure and somebody who want to do that. So we need uh, a push for that in a systematic fashion and uh, with resources made available to that kind of effort. Okay, thanks. Next uh, uh, question from Diego Melgar from the committee. Hey, I, I have a quick question for, for Bill. Um, in, you know, in, in geodesy, we obsess so much about the monument, right? To make sure that the station is measuring what the earth is doing and not the monument sinking into the soil. So I, I wonder, you know, we've talked about the importance of tide gauges so much. And whenever I've seen a tide gauge, it looks like a downwards pointing radar antenna bolted to the edge of the tide house at the end of a 100 year old wooden pier. So when you're making the tie between the GPS and the tie gauge, I wonder if the stability of the tie gauge monument is ever an issue that people contend with. I'm sure it is. I, I'm, I'm not a tide gauge expert. Um, and, you know, I've built some GPS stations. Uh, so, so I usually know what's up with the ground um, when I'm installing. Uh, so I can develop a, a sense of confidence or lack of confidence about, about what it might measure. Um, 
tie gauges, I don't know a lot of the details, but it is, um, I know it's a well understood technology. It's been around a long time. And of course there are, there's lots of things that go into building a good tide gauge and I'm sure they're not all the same. So um, the, the folks who are in touch with these kind of data, I'm sure uh, there might be someone out there who's better at answering this question than me. Um, of course, it's a concern. Um, and uh, you know, the, the water's going up and down all the time, uh, but they're measuring the, uh, the, the average level on a given day or a given month um, that is something that's insensitive to waves uh, and the systems are built to, to deal with that. Um, so I don't know, maybe, maybe there's someone out there in, in the audience who can comment more on the, on the gauges themselves. But the, 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 the one thing that tide gauges do have um, in their favor is longevity, right? You build the, the thing and it sits there and it can be there a hundred years or, or more. Um, and that's, that's an extremely stable uh, kind of measurement um, if the thing is taken care of. So NOAA in the United States and other agencies in uh, similar agencies in other countries do uh, do leveling. So they'll do um, uh, leveling from the tide gauge to a network of tidal benchmarks, which are back on off the pier essentially and on the ground. And um, so, uh, so those are done and that's, uh, I mean, in, in theory, those data are available, whether those are easy to access in terms of the long-term stability and other changes is uh, another question. But, uh, but that, that's the purpose of that is to really be able to distinguish between uh, motion of the tide gauge that is not representative of motion of the broader uh, uh, area. Yeah, um, we've seen cases of that, Jeff, with just comparing GPS and INSAR to tide gauges where the tide gauge was sort of the odd man out um, in, the, in the measurement of vertical land motion. Uh, and, and so we, you know, you've got two that, that look the same and one that looks different. You tend to trust the one that, the two uh, that agree. Um, so multiple techniques are of course advantageous. Yeah, so I'd like to take a question that actually was uh, posted back during your talk, Bill. Um, so you showed in, uh, when you were showing North America, there was a sort of a very mild or moderate uplift that was east of the Mississippi River, mostly in Tennessee and Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it wasn't entirely clear when you removed the GIA model, whether that was still there as uplift or, or, or not. But um, what is, uh, what do you think is the cause of that? And I guess more generally, when you see um, features of that sort of scale, what, what's the process for trying to figure out you know, on a discovery basis, what, what might be behind those, uh, yeah. those anomalies? Well, that, that's one of the things I, I love the most about, about doing the work in this mode, in, in discovery mode, just look at the whole field and see what's out there um, and see what's not explained yet. Uh, and that, that signal um, in Mississippi um, is not one we've studied specifically. We've gone after some other specific up signals and to, to really dig in and uh, what is it? Um, and I can um, I can say it's, in my opinion, it's not GIA <laughs> because it's way down uh, by the Gulf of Mexico almost, um, and it's a blob on the map that that doesn't look like the broad GIA kind of signal. Um, so my my guts say it's not a GIA kind of thing. Um, it's also not a plate boundary. Um, there's no uh, there's not many, there's, there's a few earthquakes out there. You know, the, the New Madrid seismic zone is not very far away, um, but we don't feel like it's uh, post-seismic relaxation from some big earthquake that happened uh, not too long ago because we know of such a, no such earthquake and we know of no such plate boundary that would cause that. Um, so we do know that there's aquifers there um, and that there's there's um, use of the aquifers and there's a lot of management of that. Um, and we haven't gone into it to more depth than that. But my gut feeling is that it's a, it's a hydrological unloading signal of some kind. Um, and what we would normally do is go in and start looking at the seasonality component to see if, if the stations go up and down more, with greater amplitude in that area. Um, if, if the rates are inflecting in ways that coincide with grace measurements um, of terrestrial water storage. Uh, and, and so there, there is sort of a, sort of have a quiver of, of tools 
that we use to go after signals like that and, and pull them apart and see how much of it is correlated with water, first of all, um, in the absence of other explanations like tectonics and earthquakes and GIA. Okay, great, thanks. Um, we've just got a few minutes left. Uh, I just to call everybody's attention to it, uh, Torbjorn uh, Tornquist put, uh, sent a link to me. Uh, it's a paper on tide gauges and how uh, well they capture vertical land motion. So I just put the link in the chat if you're interested in following that up. Um, I do have another question that uh, came from uh, Torbjorn as well, um, which is from Manu. Um, what, uh, what are the sort of the progress in getting INSAR to work in coastal wetlands when you get into the areas that are sometimes inundated, sometimes dry, sometimes kind of in between, I guess, uh, in terms of being able to get the land surface motion uh, out of that? Is that something that uh, you think that there are some good prospects for? That's one of the really challenging part because you know radar signal is a radar or INSAR is a coherent imaging technique. So we need two observations that are coherent in time. And changing in the surface cover in wetlands um, actually defy that requirement. So one, one approach is to use a corner reflectors and install them on the wetlands. But the issue with corner reflectors, such as similar to GPS, is that they need their monuments, and monument will be anchored to a certain depth. Mm -hmm. So the shallow subsidence might be lost. So for that reason, we might want to use uh, other instruments, such as RSET, um, which I can't remember for, stand for what, <laughs> but it's a tool that's uh, used for measuring very shallow compaction of the sediment in wetland, and in fact, TOR is one of those has used that a lot in Louisiana Basin uh, and uh, Mississippi area. So the combination of the two, you know, corner reflectors and this RSET instrument, I think would help us to fill that gap to measure the full spectrum of the deformation in the coastal areas, in the wetland areas. Okay, great. It's almost 145. I think it's within seconds of hitting 145. So I think, um, uh, in the interests of minimizing everybody's Zoom fatigue. I think we'll uh, thank you very much to both the speakers. We'll take a break and uh, reconvene in 30 minutes. Um, uh, the chat can disappear. I don't, I think this, well, I think this meeting will will still be there anyway. Uh, I'm not sure, but if you're interested in that link, I would, for all of you, I would, I would click on it from the chat before the chat goes away. Um, so thank you to the speakers. Uh, we'll take a break and reconvene in 30 minutes. And when we come back, uh, Maya Tolstoy is going to moderate a discussion with all of our speakers, uh, both the two from today and the four uh, from yesterday. So thanks to all the attendees and we'll see you uh, back here in 30 minutes. All right, welcome back. Um, I'm excited to moderate a discussion panel with all of our speakers. Um, ben Hamlington, Chris Pikush, uh, Pippa Whitehouse, Jackie Osterman, Bill Hammond, and Manu Shirzai. So we'll take questions from both the committee and from the audience. And as a reminder, audience members can click on the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, type in their question, and remember to press send. Uh, committee members, just raise your hands. Um, I'm going to just uh, start with a, a brief question of, of my own. And I, I want to also start by saying again, what a marvelous job all the speakers did. Um, and in particular, I really appreciated uh, the, the sort of in-depth understanding from multiple perspectives at, at quite how uh, complex this is and how relevant solid earth sciences are to it. Um, and, you know, Pippa in particular talked about the importance and complexity of, of the different feedbacks. And, and I want to um, uh, sort of think about how do we help um, uh, as a community, how do we help foster uh, the, the necessary communication between the different, the different disciplines. And one of the things that, that this committee does is try to bring together people from uh, different perspectives, different uh, agencies, different disciplines uh, to help sort of provide a bridge for people to have these discussions. So I'm curious um, within, the, within the sea level community, uh, how, do the, how do you as the panelists feel things are going in terms of uh, broad cross communication between the different disciplines and are there 
more things that that should be happening could be happening uh, whether it's um, from a funding perspective or you know we always want more data and more funding but also you know meetings forums what kind of things uh, are working well at the moment and what more should be done to sort of enhance the important communication on this on this really vital interdisciplinary problem and whoever wants to go first can go first or I can start calling on you I can uh, go ahead and, and speak to that. This is Ben Hamilton. Um, so so you, you make a, a really good point that there's this need for this um, interdisciplinary research to, to tackle some of these issues. So one effort that, that I'm involved in is the NASA sea level change team. So this is an effort, a science team that was spun up by, by NASA recognizing that a lot of these problems are interdisciplinary and the need to bring scientists from dif different disciplines together to tackle these issues. And so Steve Neerum was the, the first team lead. I'm the team lead of, of that team now. And we've kind of been finding our feet in how to really engage across disciplines and really um, start to do these investigations, bringing different pieces together. And it's certainly a work in progress. Um, so there, there are, I think, funding, the agencies recognize a need to address sea level in this way, in an interdisciplinary way, and bring the pieces together. I still think as scientists, we're trying to figure out exactly how to take advantage of the different areas of expertise. I should also note that's, I mean, that's a group of 70-ish uh, sea level scientists um, nationally. There's all these other international efforts and other pieces going on that we need to pull together. So it's it's a really a big organizational effort, international organization effort to um, to pull the necessary pieces together. So I think that funding agencies recognize this and are working towards this. Again, it's still a work in progress. I'd be interested to hear other thoughts from uh, other panelists and their experience. Great, thank you. Um, who else can comment on this? I mean, I'll, I'll jump on um, after Ben. So I'm also um, participating in this round of the sea level change team. And like Ben said, this has been a current effort of NASA's to fund this sort of interdisciplinary work. And that's, and that's fantastic. Um, uh, one thing about the NASA sea level change team is it's very centered on, um, if you will, certain timescales, certain kinds of observations, which viewing the whole realm of sea level science is very limited. I mean, not surprisingly, the NASA sea level change focuses a lot on satellite data, which if, you, if you're talking about sea level is the last three decades um, or so. Um, so something like the NASA sea level change would not facilitate the kind of interdisciplinary work to say, understand 20th century or common era or Holocene sea level change. So, um, I mean, in an ideal world, there would be interdis interdisciplinary programs like this, not only at NASA, but through um, agencies like the National Science Foundation, you know, funders that have sort of in mind in their portfolio, sort of broader timescales and different data sets, different driving questions, because again, the, the NASA, um, uh, the sea level change is in increasingly driven by sort of these, these, I don't wanna call them impacts, but applications. Um, and, and that necessarily favors a certain kind of analysis, a certain kind of question. Um, and so again, maybe broadening the, the number of opportunities both domestically in the US, but also um, sort of uh, you know, in other countries internationally, um, I think that's really necessary. And, and perhaps the seeable change team is, is one data point that could be you know, towards a blueprint of how to do that well. Thank you. Um, May I add also to this conversation? Please. Yes. So um, I, I have been also on the NASA Sea Level Change Team and I really enjoyed that. Um, and I, but I think that the, the, the type of questions that are asked uh, should be different. You know, the question should be driven by the stakeholders that are affected by sea level rise and hazard associated with that. And the scientists try to provide input to solve that. So, my, my dream team would be to have a scientist next to social scientists, you know, the, the basic scientists, social scientists, engineers, lawyers, and policymakers together to come up with the, with the, with the, with the framework that ask uh, questions that impact eventually the ordinary people or economy and so on. What we do as a scientist, I mean, we enjoy it. I mean, don't take it wrong, I have a great time. <laughs> But sometimes I have the feeling that there is a gap between my outcome and the, really the person who is the end of the chain that is going to be affected by the sea level rise eventually. You know, the house, the person that loses the house, the, the industry that is going to be affected, or the habitat, coastal habitat that's going to be lost. 
So I, I think we, you know, future report should integrate all this if possible. And I think if we want to make impact, we should make it possible. Thank you. I think that's a really important point. And I think, it, you know, it's something um, we've actually been thinking about. I mean, I think everyone's thinking about this now, but also the, the uh, racial inequi inequities in, in the impacts of, of climate change are, are really profound and, you know, sea level absolutely as well. So I, I, I really appreciate your making that point. Um, can we hear from the other three panelists what, what, what their perspective is on this? Catch, I just call on you, Jackie. I yeah, see. I can. I can add a little bit. I, I mean, um, there are some initiatives that try to kind of bridge those gaps more, and Pippa is leading one of those. The Cersei and Jeff and a lot of people here are aware and involved in this, um, which connects kind of the solid earth dynamics and the ice sheet dynamics. I think um, so. I think that you know, GIA modelers and, and ice sheet models. I think there is a lot of interactions, but I think. I think there could be more um, interaction and, 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 and a platform for interactions towards the other geo, geophysics communities, so seismology, geodynamics, mineral physics. Um, I think you've got from both in my and, uh, and Pippa's talk that, that those are really critical links. And um, there are definitely connections. And you know, I think every you know, GI model has probably collaborations across that, but there isn't. I think the thinking about workshops or, or, or platforms that really fosters those interactions, I think those exist less. Um, and I don't know, Pippa, if you see this differently. Um, and I think um, to Manu's point, I think that, you know, the co-production of knowledge and how we drive that forward is another really important uh, important um, aspect. And, and we can also talk about, I mean, it's, I see it a little bit that maybe possibly as a separate um, aspect, but that I'd be really interested in talking about more as well. Do you want to? Yeah, I'll come in there. Um, the program that Jackie refers to, it um, it looks at interactions between ice sheets um, and the solid earth specifically, um, and it comes under SCAR, um, which is the Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research. Um, we essentially get funding to put lots of different people in the same room and see what happens, um, which um, it can often be a little bit quiet to begin with, um, but we've got some amazing discussions going on. And I'd say it's actually really influenced the direction of the science in the last decade. I, I gave a talk at the start of this program and at the end, and I checked my slides from the first talk and there's stuff eight years later, which I didn't even mention in the first one. Um, so it's, yeah, it's difficult to, to get those people in the same room. Um, something I'll also reflect on is, trying to program um, the recent SCAR conference, which ended up online, unfortunately. Um, this is all to do with Antarctica. And there's often many, many different sessions running in parallel. And this year, we specifically tried to reduce the number of sessions and essentially make people make a choice of, well, I should go to something. So I'll go to that one. It's not quite what I do. Um, but actually, I wanted that person to be in there and listen to something different for a change. So just um, using that approach um, in programming some conferences is, is something to think about. It's a really smart idea. Thank you. Bill? Um, I guess I agree with what has been said so far. Um, <clears throat> I think we're also seeing currently a, 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 the positive impact of having a, a lot of data streams being open, um, available for, for anybody to use without any kind of permission or, or access or you know, to, to reduce the boundary to, to zero um, for people getting access to data. Mm -hmm. and, and lots of it in places where they didn't even know it was present before and, and giving them the ability to, to Gener to, to the awareness of it, first of all, which relies on people like us going out and telling everybody we know that it's there, um, but also showing what can be done with it and um, what potential exists um, and encouraging people to contribute their data in ways that are open um, is, is sometimes they're not interested um, and 
they need convincing. Um, so that, that's that's a very general statement, but I think we're seeing the benefit now of, of people kind of getting on board with that and, and thinking it's a really good idea and that the net gain is worth um, whatever potential risks are in, in sharing data um, and results from analyses um, and getting them online and, uh, and, and explained and, and easily accessible uh, to the maximum number of people. Yes, I, the, another really important point. I couldn't agree with you more on that. And and thank you, you brought that up in your talk also, I think. And uh, with something in the marine seismic community, we've we've started to get on board with, and it has made an enormous difference. It's re really, really important. Okay, now I've got a, a bunch of raised hands from the from the committee. So I'm gonna call on Steve next. Do you want to unmute yourself? Sure, I mean, this. my question kind of relates back to Maya's initial question and somewhat what Phil just said, but it's probably mainly directed for Jackie and Pippa, but you know, we heard about all these great new data sets, relatively new, um, that all have uh, the deformation of the solid earth in there somewhere, maybe not exclusively, but like GRACE data, we didn't talk a lot about GRACE, but there's a lot of great GA signals in GRACE. Uh, Bill was showing GAA signals, and, and yet I don't see, and, and maybe it's just that I'm not uh, kind of an active member of the GAA community, but I don't see those data sets being used extensively to improve GAA models or improve isolating models. And I wondered, is that because these data sets have multiple signals uh, mixed in, or, or am I, have I just missed uh, something here? So I'll, I'll go first on that. Um, there is um, one way in which we're using those satellite data to get at the, the GIA signal, um, specifically in areas which still have ice sheets. Um, and that's where we're combining the GRACE data with altimetry data. And both of those data sets contain a signal due to ice mass change or ice volume change and solid earth rebound. Um, and so by combining those data sets with their different sensitivities to, to ice mass and GIA, there are approaches that back out the GIA signal there. So that's um, a specific one which is carried out in Antarctica. Um, on a global scale, um, I think there, there are efforts, um, I'm not, not so much involved in global scale GIA modeling, um, but there are efforts to use the GRACE data and improve our understanding there. Um, but yeah, one of the, the, the big questions is, is Grace is so good at measuring everything. Um, so you need to have a good understanding of the different components that go into it. I guess I can add to that. I think it's mostly used Grace and the GPS data in Antarctica and Greenland. Um, and I would say there it is used to test and look at the GIA models. Um, and then of course, yeah, for the Laurentide, refining the Laurentide ice sheet history and, and the Fenoscanian ice sheet history, it's used, um, but I would agree with you actually that it's probably not used as much as it could and should be. And I really enjoyed the talks um, today and took a lot of notes because I found it actually really inspiring. So um, that, you know, this is potentially a, a, a areas that could be bridged and in incorporated more, but, but it is also, I mean, I6G includes GPS data and, and gravity data as constraints on the ice sheet model. So they are, they are being used, um, but might, maybe not extensively and as widely, you know, um, as they should. Thanks. Thank All right, uh, Jeff, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, so I think this question is more uh, aimed probably at Chris and, uh, and at Ben. Um, so, I mean, today, uh, Bill and Manu were talking about the variety of timescales in the vertical land motion signal. And of course, there are in the, in the oceanographic components, the, 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 the signals that purely come from the ocean. One of the things that is striking when you look at the altimetry, the sort of spatial map of present day sea level rise or sea level change rate is that even with 25 years, it, it doesn't look like global mean sea level at all. I mean, there's very, very strong differences. And what my question is, when we look at the multi-decadal and maybe even centennial scales, what do we know about variation within the ocean? Uh, do we understand uh, what is, is driving, um, you know, let's say, if we had 100 years of altimetry, how, how close would we get to GMSL? 
versus looking at longer term patterns. How much do we know about those longer term uh, variations within the ocean? You wanna take that first then? Uh, sure, um, I can start and then you can certainly add, uh, add detail or whatever I've missed. But um, so, so there, there is work being done to assess the extent to which the altimeter trend map represents what we call the forced response. So Steve uh, and John Pasulo have, have been doing quite a bit of work on that. Um, and, and you say, hey, you have to start bringing in model projections of, um, of sea level in order to make that assessment. So given the current length of the, the altimeter record, it's still reflective of natural variability, certainly in, in a lot of locations. Um, and, and as the altimeter record lengthens with the launch of Sentinel-6A and Sentinel-6B, we would expect that trend map to keep shifting in some areas. Um, but as uh, John Fasulo has shown, in certain areas, it's possible that forced response. So, I mean, that. I guess to, to maybe put this another way, we, we don't expect the ocean to be flat, obviously, the longer, or the sea level rise to be flat, the longer the record. There's going to be a spatial uh, distribution of these trends associated with the fingerprints, the GRD response, and also a stereodynamic um, signature as well. So we can make that comparison with models. And in some locations, we do start to see, um, potentially see that signal emerge, typically where you have less interannual to decadal variability. That's where you'd expect to see it first. So. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, certainly maybe Chris can, can provide a, another answer, but I think all this is to say that, and we've heard this multiple times, continuing these records, these satellite records, it's really critical to try to make that assessment. What is forced sea level change? What we might expect to continue on in the future? What is uh, just reflective of, of still natural variability in, in the record? So it's an important research question. And again, really points to the need for, for continuing these records that we have. Yeah, so I'll add on to that a little bit. I like that Ben made the distinction between, you know, the so-called forced response versus the uh, component of, of sea level variability observed, say, by an altimeter that reflects sort of a noise process, say, natural variability. Uh, and what Ben says is, is valid there. But I'll, I think what's important to reiterate, also something that Ben said, is um, the other speakers can correct me, but I'm, I'm unaware of any process in the ocean, in the solid earth um, involving the cryosphere that would lead to a horizontally uniform change in sea level at any time scale in the deep past or in the present. So I don't think we're ever going to see that horizontally uniform change. But I think a deeper question that you point to is a really good one, which uh, ben, ben hinted to, which is, you know, if we have that 100 year altimeter record, um, what would it look like? Uh, I know that Ben has done some work trying to reconstruct that pattern. Also, Carling Hay has, has looked at, at, at things like this and more recently, Thomas Frederick. So what, you know, what, is, what does the pattern, to the best of our knowledge, look like over, say, the 20th century? Um, and and there's, a, there's a lot of uncertainty there. For instance, to the extent that we know uh, changes in, in uh, land ice mass, we can have a good estimate of what the associated spatial patterns of sea level change are. Um, but one thing we don't know very, very well um, is you know, what patterns are related to, to ocean circulation changes. In other words, do if you have that 100 year record, so, so right now in the 30 year altimeter record, if you look at a map like, like Ben showed, it really is the, the most charismatic features really are ocean dynamical. A lot of people have focused on those really small scale uh, uh, features that are associated with uh, mesoscale eddies and instabilities of strong Western boundary currents. Uh, it's not clear what that would look like in a 100 year record. It's not clear if, if sort of the, the, the more GRD, the gravitational, rotational and deformational signals would become, or not the deformational, but the gravitational and rotational signals would become more apparent. We don't know. Um, so I think there's a lot of work we have to do as, as physical oceanographers to understand the low frequency variability spectrum uh, of ocean circulation. Uh, certainly we can interrogate models for that, but there are important questions about how um, uh, realistic uh, the models are uh, on those long time scales. Um, so there are a lot of open questions, I think. So it's a long way of saying I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's good. To, I mean, good to hear where the, the things are. I think uh, uh, maybe a quick question that one of you could answer is, in terms of the steric, uh, forced steric uh, component uh, of 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 that. What what sort of magnitude does that reach uh, in terms of, uh, um, you know, most outside of the proximal areas, most of the fingerprint. Uh, from sort of gravitational redistribution. Most of those are relatively small outside of the proximal areas to where the ice is really changing. Um, but uh, yeah, are there centimeter per year level steric uh, variations? And, and what, what, yeah, what, what's the real magnitude of those? Yeah, I mean, it depends on time scale. I mean, to, to 
I mean, Ben highlighted an important region yesterday in his talk is if you, if you look at the altimeter record and you look at somewhere like the Western Tropical Pacific, um, these trends that you see, again, really enhanced rates. Uh, ben, I'll correct me if I'm wrong, but you're looking at something on the order of a centimeter per year for the last three decades. That's primarily steric, specifically thermosteric, related to changes in ocean heat content, either related to local addition of heat or uh, changes in ocean circulation or transport that converge heat in that region. So certainly on the multi-decadal time scale, on those regional spatial scales, uh, you can see magnitudes of that mag values of that magnitude. Um, but as I, and you'll probably get sick of hearing me say this, I'm kind of like a broken record, but it, it will depend strongly on space scale and time scale. If you zoom out to the global average, magnitudes aren't that much. As we heard said, the last you know decade, a decade and a half, that, that steric signal is much smaller on the global average and contributes about one third to the total. Um, roughly similar values if you zoom out to the 20th century, although lower magnitude. So, so it, it, again, it is a question of spatial scale. Um, and, and it even works in the other way. I mean, as you go to sort of smaller scales, um, and, and, and shorter time scales, um, you'll expect even larger magnitudes, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another important point, it's, it reminds me of all politics are local and apparently all sea level is local too. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> um, with that, I'm gonna call on uh, Thorsten. Well, thanks Maya, and thanks again to the speakers. I you know, we, we heard about the importance of open and, and co-located data sets, right? And the importance of really doing even more to, to bring the communities together and, and discuss these interdisciplinary programs, something that can be said for, for many, um, many fields of study. But I wonder about the dynamics and the modeling aspects of some of these interactions. And I think there, there is perhaps even more of a challenge because the communities that have run say numerical models in the, to the solid earth realm are traditionally distinct from the ones who've modeled the cryosphere and, and the climate. Even though we've been saying for decades, there's commonalities between how rocks deform and ice deform. And so, um, and I think the community is also at a different level, right? We have a sort of strong support structure, NCAR and others, you know, assistance for the climate part. And I, I wonder what, what our panelists think about, you know, uh, the community resources that might really help to accelerate the research there. And I think, you know, Jackie already commented on some of the, some of the questions there from the GA modeling, right, where models with lateral viscosity variations have recently become available, but there's a need for benchmarks. And we've, and I just wonder if you could sort of build on that. Where, where would you see most sort of synergies, and how could computational community infrastructure help with these conversations across the disciplines that we'll probably need to continue to have? I would. Oh, Bill. Sorry, um, a, a thought I have, Thorsten, is um, is when when looking at the talks um, or, and when preparing my talk, I, I I saw there's a lot there's GIA models out there that that are accessible and can be downloaded and people can think about them. Maybe not all of them are are there, but they they really help us understand um, what what's the plausible kind of signal that we're going to get at it at a GIA and these things are available. And um, we also have models that are accessible plate tectonic movement, like horizontal motions of the plates. You know, you, there, there are a number of models that are accessible, we can get that. Um, but we don't have a community model for vertical land motion associated with plate tectonics, like the subduction zones, um, mount building in, uh, in convergence, convergent boundaries, um, what, I mean, if we had a, a new class of model that, that could be available for, for everyone um, to, to access that was just the tectonic part of vertical land motion, that would be, a, I think, a very achievable bite that could be taken um, and worked on by a group, a program, a person. Um, that's, that's one thing that could be done. Um, in this, in this spirit that I think you're suggesting. Um, and there are other things like, like the um, hydrological loading that's accessible through GRACE. Um, we, could, we could have vertical 
land motion that's you know a time series of that people are working on that now so so in the future i think we're going to have from better handle on atmosphere and uh hydrological loading effects at the time series level that can be um accessed and compared to all these other things to see if they are the explanation for the signals we're seeing yeah, just to bill like let me push a little bit more there for example you mentioned the predictions from some of the GIE models are available, but you know, um, often it's not the whole workflow that is available. And we've heard how things are coupled, right? And ice loads might be derived with viscosity models that are inconsistent with some of the things that people want to do. And I guess, is there an opportunity to, you know, to sort of not have just the final model, but also some sort of framework to, to get at a community understanding of, of how you get there. And I think similar things apply in, in all kinds of aspects of this problem, no? Are you asking me? It's more of a comment, right? Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, I was gonna, yeah, yeah. No, sorry, I was just gonna chime in here because uh, I actually, it was really great to hear that you thought that GI models are accessible and, and available <laughs> because I actually think that the, the GI modeling community compared to the other kind of computational, you know, geodynamics or seismology, I think is behind on sharing um, uh, code development as well as sharing model output. So there are some available, but I think it's quite limited and it, there's also no centralized platform i think it would be fantastic to have you know like iris like a centralized platform that has the different ice models that are available or different ga predictions and those could be um you know associated with, with different publications and i think there's definitely a trend towards making that more available um, as supplementary information but it's not been done traditionally and um for example for the ice sheet um, reconstructions it's really a limited set of reconstructions that are available, um, and and I think this and and you know and then limits my work. And I think the same could probably be said for the GA model output, and that limits other people's work. So I think there is a lot more data sharing that could be done. And for, from the model output, I think in parallel um, on the observational data, um, and, and I think there's a movement towards that, which I think is great, but. On the observational data, there's definitely been a, a, a strong push for that in the last five years. And um, the Holocene uh, databases, last interglacial um, sea level databases are being more and more compiled and synthesized and standardized. Um, and that's super important and just really, really useful. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. So I think uh, Mark has a, has a follow up. Oh, can I can I actually build, build on this? But I think this is a really important topic, and I'm I'm liking what the the other uh, speakers have said so far. So I'll I'll, I'll build on this. Um, yeah, I, I think there's there's a lot of room here, a lot of room to make um, models and the workflow more accessible, more public, more available through things like GitHub uh, and other open source things. Um, also, I, I'm not sure if this is obvious, but my perspective on this is that yes, we need to do this as people have suggested with the GIA models and the tectonic models and the, and the geophysical models. But there's also a lot of room here for um, probabilistic models, you know, have, having probabilistic frameworks that, you know, as we start collecting these, these new data sources and new models, having ways to, to, to synthesize them um, and, and making, that, uh, making that available. Because, you know, with all these communities, with both the geophysical modeling community and the probabilistic modeling community, um, the, the room tends to be dominated by a couple of personalities, right? And, and, I, and I would love to see a more accessibility and equity there so that more, more folks feel able to contribute to that and have access to that workflow, not just the results. Um, and one more thing I wanted to, uh, two more things actually really quick. One is I think we need, we need to prior, prioritize funding people to be doing these things because commonly, uh, I mean, there are certainly programs to the exception, but, but often you know, take, this is all labor intensive, right? Sort of generating data, making it available, taking the time to, to sort of, um, you know, mark up your code well. And, and, and I mean, this is, this is all time consuming. And I, and I think that, I mean, it's sort of my idealized world that there would be, you know, the recognition from the funding agencies that, that these are priorities, that these speed science uh, in progress and that, and that funds should support scientists to do that so that we don't feel yeah. completely stressed. Like when we're publishing the paper, like, oh, I don't want to take another week put together my exactly. supplementary material, even though that would really help the community. I think um, that's a very important point to, to, to note, right? Where 
there should be funding and support and there should also be perhaps better infrastructure to help the individual PIs with their tasks so that we don't say, oh, we should, wouldn't it be nice? And somehow it has to be supported. If, if I could just come in with a, a comment as well. Thanks, Maya. Um, I think we've sort of flagged up a, a common um, issue with the word model in the last few minutes. Um, so one is being able to run a numerical model and, and one is the model, which is the output. Um, and I, I, I agree with Jackie. I think the GIA community is, is a little bit behind in providing a model that everyone can download and run. Um, and that that's there, there are a few out there. Um, but that's an area we're a little bit behind um, places like uh, glaciology. Um, ice sheet models are, were sort of started to be developed at that point where people were sharing code um, and they, they're much more accessible. Um, just a quick comment about GIA model output. Um, I think it, it would be feasible for, for us to have a repository where people upload their model predictions of the global GIA field. Um, I just like to, it's a little bit of a, um, an issue with me about how we define GIA. Um, it's the response to past ice sheet change. Um, past ice sheet change is stuff that happened last decade. Um, in, if you define it, take it to that um, extreme. So for somewhere like Alaska, if we were looking at the, the maps that the bill was showing, if you take out something like I6G, which looks at um, the LGM ice sheet um, to present, it doesn't account for recent ice sheet change on the centennial scale. And that actually should really be counted as GIA. Um, so that's part of the reason why we're a little bit cautious to release our models, because we sort of know they're going to be wrong in those areas with recent ice sheet change. Um, and just one more point, it gets a little bit technical and it comes back to Steve's question um, about grace. Um, in those areas where um, we have contemporary ice mass loss and we're trying to ask the question of, okay, what in the signal is GIA and what is ice mass loss? If we're in an area with low viscosity upper mantle, the ice mass loss could be triggering a viscous response. So usually we, when we account for the ice mass change, we assume it excites an elastic response. There are areas like Alaska, like the Antarctic Peninsula, um, and the Amundsen Sea area, where actually that, that standard approach um, of separating the GIA and the ice mass needs to be thought about a little bit more carefully with low viscosity mantle areas. That was just a personal little point. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mark, do you, you have a follow up, I believe? Yeah, I, it was actually more just kind of a comment on one of the points Jackie made that. You know, it's an interesting time right now in terms of computational geodynamics, geophysics, because two of the big programs in this area, um, CIG and CSDMS, are both basically up for renewal within the next year. And I was just wondering whether there had been any conversation in the community about, you know, sea level could be a great new working group for either of these two um, NSF funded um, organizations, and I was just kind of curious whether there had been any discussion about pushing for that in the renewal of either of those programs. I can I can talk about this just very briefly. Um, so CIG has a sea level code, a one D sea level a ho hosts a one D sea level code, um, and then they also host Aspect, which is which they're incorporating three D GA. Um, so it's on their radar. I haven't heard about establishing a new working group around it because I guess the working groups are often around specific codes, but maybe not necessarily. So, and this would really build on other codes. Um, but um, I think that is really interesting. We had a meeting planned for this year, which is now postponed to next year, where we actually um, a, um, a paleo sea level meeting where we invited. Um, some people from CIG to talk about open um, 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 software development and acknowledging code development more and funding it more. So the, you know we're talking about those connections, but I but it's interesting that you bring up of actually making it formally a, a working group, a part of any of those. And I haven't heard any conversations um, in that direction. It's a good point. I mean, I think that would be a really exciting direction to go because I think you could gain more traction in the community. I mean, absolutely, that's right aspect is there, but 
the kind of thrust of aspect has been, you know, mantle convection and then trying to build in lithospheric deformation, long-term tectonics. Um, and, you know, not all of the working groups at CIG have always been that way. Like the, um, the magma dynamics working group started before there was any code there at all. So, you know, and it just might be a way of getting more traction. And I think the same for CSTMS, which focuses on the surface processes, bringing in um, connections to um, the groups there as well. Anyway, it was just a thought in terms of kind of trying to move the, the ball along a little bit. All right, thanks. Cindy. Yeah, well, can I keep going a little bit with, with that idea about, um, so well, there are two, two prongs of what I wanted to, to talk about is that um, many of the, the um, CSCMS and CIG have education components, a large, um, a big group within, or a, a big push within those groups is to to maybe even enhance or increase, and also cohort building. So you, you sea level community has scattered, smallish groups um, without, and so you need the global cohort. Well, same problems in in other areas, um, and we we all recognize the need to communicate across disciplines. So so one part part of the question was about. Um, joining forces in the education about sea level and communication as a as a really important sail or push also for the climate change issue. It's an easier sell. But the other thing that I'm um, you know, wondering how easy it would be to put together a toolkit for local communities. This goes back more to Manu and Bill and others talk, thinking about sample data sets, demonstrations that we can take to high schools in coastal areas, that we can take to university students and go beyond, oh, if the ice melt, if there's some great examples on, on um, UNAFCO, but they're not the same as the compelling stories that we're talking about um, with inundation levels in Houston or examples that start to, to link people to the process and to the, the challenges. So, um, I, and I guess those both are kind of related to education. So there you go, I'll throw that out there. May I add, may, may I have a comment? Please, please, yeah. yes. Go on. So, well, we, we tried that a few times to, you know, to present some of those results to local people. But the point is that it caused um, if, uh, often panic. Then actually, the, 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 my, my experience was that the way we presented that as scientists was not the best way of doing it, you know? So we asked always the question, what is the rate of, for example, subsidence? Or what is the rate of sea level rise? Or what is the area that's going to be inundated? For people, the question is what I should do when I have this amount of sea level rise? And we were not able to answer that question and it caused more confusion because, <laughs> you know, uh, for, for ordinary people, this number has very little meaning. So if sea level is rises in this area, five centimeters in total, what is going to happen to them? And what is their option? And what is uh, the help they get? What is the damage and so on? So, I think taking these maps and this data to classroom um, probably has educational advantages, but I'm, I'm worried about the consequences if it's not translated properly. Wait, sorry, I didn't mean to say to take your science. Re I, I, I didn't mean in that way. I, I, I was trying to use as an example how compelling the challenges are, and I, you know, you know where I, I'm, I'm in New Orleans and uh, tours in, at Tulane as well with Tor. Um, but I just wanted to um, ask whether there were ways that we could teach high school and university students um, some of the challenge that is we have and link these to people and consequences. Um, I, I think many of us are trying, but maybe as a community, we could have some tools or some kits and also maybe excite some students in going in this and working in this direction for research as well. I can, so, so I mean, one, one comment here, I, I think Manu is, 
he outlined a lot of the challenges of trying to communicate the science to decision makers. I think what you're referring to is a little bit of, of different terms of education of high school, college students, things like that. So prior to coming to, um, to living in California at the Jet Propulsion Lab, I was a uh, professor at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia, and I was teaching a 100 level understanding global climate change class. And Norfolk, Virginia, where Old Dominion is located, is really impacted by coastal flooding, similar to, I mean, not in the exact same way as where, where you are, but certainly there's issues there. And I, I taught this course several times, and it was only after trying to bring in those local examples and connecting to their everyday life. I mean, there were days where there was flooding outside, it impacted their ability to get to, to school, to come to class, things like that. That's where it started to resonate with them. So I, I started to try to, to tailor almost everything, all my discussions about global climate change to the local experience. And a lot of the things we're discussing here, we can link back to that local experience. So you can convey that, that science um, to, to their everyday life in a pretty clear way. Um, certainly that's gonna be more challenging for someone living in the interior of the United States or, or a different country. But um, so, so maybe to, to get more to your question. So I, I started to make these resources or, or go through the process, the time consuming process of, of getting these resources, these teaching resources. Um, but I, I found that other professors, other teachers and other locations were struggling with the same thing. So there was kind of an informal network that was being set up of people sharing ideas and materials for class. Um, so, so I would say that the interest is there in exactly what you're describing. I think there needs to be mechanisms to and, and funding to try to establish these links in a more formal way and allow people to be connected. I think the resources are out there. I think that they're just sitting on, on one person's computer or one person's syllabus as opposed to being shared more broadly. So um, I think your comment really resonates with, with my previous experience and hopefully there are some funding mechanisms to develop these kits and to extend our science in, a, in that direction. Yeah, I, I certainly understand it. If anybody wants um, all kinds of um, uh, pressure or temperature um, as a hurricane eye goes overhead and passes, you know, more than welcome. We've had quite a few. So yeah, no, I, um, but it, no, it's a lot easier to teach when they've just been through one. <laughs> well, I think that's a, a great place to end it. We are unfortunately out of time, but um, thank you for, for all that input. and, and um, then that's particularly helpful advice. And, and I think it also goes back to Manu's original point about engaging stakeholders. And I think it's really important that we communicate with local community leaders and, and local community NGOs and find out what is useful for them as well. Um, so thank you for, for ending on that very important uh, point, Cindy, as well. And now I will hand it over to Steve to uh, wrap things up. But once again, huge thank you to, to all our speakers. And, all right, Steve, take it away. Great, that's not Maya. Uh, so I'm gonna try and wrap this up. It's kind of hard to distill down, uh, you know, three hours, six talks um, that we've heard over the last two days, but I'll give it a shot here. So first, I think we learned that uh, satellite measurements are providing a wealth of new information about sea level change, including sea surface height. Uh, examples of that are Jason 3, but also uh, in about a week now, we're gonna launch uh, Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich uh, from Vandenberg. I will continue that time series. Also ice sheet height, uh, ISAT 2 and cryosat are examples there, and ice sheet mass changes from Grace follow on as well as INSAR observations and a variety of other uh, tools that we have. Um, and they, sh they show, you know, collectively, they show that sea level has been rising uh, since the early 1990s at an average rate of about three millimeters per year. Uh, but the rate of rise is accelerating by about 0.1 millimeters per year every year. So uh, back in the early 90s, it was about two millimeters per year. And, and now we're over four millimeters per year so over the last 30 years. So. And the same satellite data and other data sources have uh, shown us that this is, we know for certain that, that this rise in sea level is caused by uh, ice melt and thermal expansion of the oceans and uh, the acceleration is being largely driven by the melting ice. Uh, and all of this is due to the warming of the earth. Uh, we also learned there's, there's considerable regional variation in sea level change due to the the fingerprints of the ice mass loss on sea level, and then variations in where the oceans absorb the excess heat. Um, and so 
understanding and ultimately predicting these regional variations is going to be key to understanding uh, future local impacts of sealable change. So melting ice and thermal expansion not only cause a change in the volume of the oceans, but also lead to changes in ocean circulation that can impact sea level as well, especially for the western boundary currents. But the largest uncertainty for projecting future sea level changes determining how quickly the ice sheets are going to melt. And so their uh, understanding ocean ice interactions is one area of current research that will be critical here but also understanding how the solid earth responds to loading and unloading of the ice sheets is gonna be critical for understanding ice sheet dynamics. So in this latter topic is gonna to require a better understanding of the internal viscosity structure of the earth. So in addition, studying past seeable change and how the solid earth responded in the past to uh, ice loading and unloading can help us understand how the earth will respond to present day changes and also help us figure out what will happen in the future. So, and this will require better estimates of the past uh, ice loads and their spatial distribution. Measuring vertical crust motion, as we learned today, is an important piece of the puzzle, both for understanding the internal structure of the earth as well as for mapping areas of land subsidence that will exacerbate the impacts of sea level rise. Uh, dense GNSS networks uh, have been helpful in uh, mapping these variations as well as uh, satellite-based interferometric SAR measurements. And so these two tools have provided uh, new global and regional estimates of vertical land motion that we can use for these studies. I think critically uh, understanding the physical processes driving these estimates of vertical crustal motion is important if we're going to be able to predict uh, future vertical crustal motion that can be incorporated in projections of relative sealable change. So in summary, uh, much progress is being made, both due to the availability of new data sets and new modeling and data analysis techniques. Um, I think we critically own that understanding sealable change is a multidisciplinary undertaking that involves oceanographers, hydrologists, glaciologists, climate modelers, geodesists, solid earth geophysicists, and a variety of other fields. So advancing our understanding of how sea level will change in the future will require all these disciplines to work together as many of the challenging problems lie in between the disciplines. All these changes take place on a deformable solid earth. And so understanding how the solid earth responds to sea level and ice mass changes is a critical piece of the puzzle. So I'll stop there and just say that on behalf of the committee, I wanna thank all of our speakers and also the audience for joining us for the meeting. As a reminder, the recordings will be available on our website within a few days. Also, we'll be sending out a short evaluation of the meeting next week. Um, I know we all hate doing uh, evaluations and polls, but if you have a moment, please consider responding. So thanks again, and everybody enjoy your afternoon.